Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this special graduate webinar brought to you by the National Career Service, working in partnership with ACAS. My name is Craig Garton, and I'm the Director of Operations, working for the National Career Service in the Southeast. The National Career Service, for those that, that don't know, is available to provide free and impartial information, advice, and guidance, helping people to make decisions on learning, training, and work. This is the first time we've delivered an event of this nature for graduates and in this year of firsts, thanks to the pandemic we're all experiencing, now more than ever it's important you all understand all of the sources of information available to help you and are able to make an informed decision before making that next step. Okay, before we start, let's take a look at the agenda for the webinar, which you've probably seen. So this should appear on the screen for you in a second. This is a good opportunity also for me to thank all of our guest speakers today. As you'll see from the agenda, it's, it's a packed morning and it's going to be an interesting watch with time at the end for your questions. Finally, just want to remind everyone that the webinar will be recorded this morning and the link to view the recording will be shared with you in due course. So all that's left for me to do is to thank you again for joining us. I hope you enjoy the morning and get a lot out of it. I'm now going to hand over to Mark Linton, who is the president of ADCAS, and Mark's going to take you through the rest of this morning's session. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Linton. I'm director of the Career Service at Newcastle University. Well, hold on, Mark. We can't see you for some reason. Oh. Hold on one second. <laughs> That's probably a bonus. I know, I know. We may have this issue because there's so many of you, but you're, but you're live. Go ahead. OK, great. Thank you so much. OK, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Linton. I'm director of the Career Service at Newcastle University. I'm also president of ADCAS. ADCAS is the Association of Graduate Careers Advisory Services. So we represent university career services. And as Craig has said already, thanks for joining. Hope you're going to find this morning enjoyable. Hope you're going to find it interesting. Most importantly, um, if you're looking for information and advice to support you in making your next career step, um, that we, we hope you go away with lots of ideas, lots of useful contacts um, that are going to help you. Uh, we're delighted as ACAS to be co-hosting today uh, because we want to convey a simple message and that is that every university career service supports um, our graduates and um, and now it's easier than ever. One of the things about the pandemic is it is easier to get in touch. So um, so hopefully that will come across today, uh, whether you want to come to your career service or the National Careers, National Careers Service. Um, by, by way of introduction, I mean, we've got a lot of speakers today. I can still remember what it was like to graduate, remove, move home to my parents in Somerset, and uh, think that nobody would be interested in recruiting a psychology graduate. And now I've got the perspective of my two daughters who have both graduated recently. And um, the, the bit of advice I've given them is don't look at Instagram, don't look at social media, because it seems that everybody is doing better than, than you. Um, it is a tough job market and that will come across today, but there are jobs out there and um, hopefully today will help you to find the job uh, or whatever it is you're looking to do to do next. Um, so I'm going to just introduce uh, some of our speakers today and um, our first speaker is Stephen Watering from the National Career Service. He's going to talk about career options, transitions, what employers have identified as future skills for the new world of work. Now with all of our speakers, if you've got questions, please put them into the chat and we're going to store them up throughout the event and and uh, Steve and Natalie who are helping us are going to be saving saving them up. So put any questions into chat. We'll come back to them at the end of this morning and if by any chance they're not answered, uh, we will follow up after the event. So Steve, over to you. Thank you there, Mark, and I'm um, hoping you can all see me. Um, and first of all, good morning to you all. And of course, a huge congratulations for completing your degree in what's turned out to be a very unusual and somewhat challenging 2020. I was thinking about this. You've kind of probably gone from attending lectures and seminars in person, spending time with your peers, having access to a range of facilities, including the student bar, the sports facilities, and dare I say at the library, to now doing things remotely and virtually. During this time, you've probably also um, harnessed various skills, including resilience, self-motivation, determination, and a whole lot more. 
But at some stage, you're likely to have taken stock of your current situation and thought, what next? So Julia, is it all right to share my presentation, please? Is it sharing? Yep, that's done. Go ahead. Brilliant. Nice one. Thank you. So why have I popped up these lyrics taken from Baz Luhrmann's number one here? Everybody is free to take where to wear sunscreen. Well, people often feel pressured to make decisions, have a plan and be successful. So you may have chosen a career, identified a route or a path to take and then boom, a boulder appears on that pathway. Not only does this boulder block that path, but it also obscures the vision of that long term goal. Now, the COVID pandemic is a case in hand, but how can you deal with such situations successfully? Well, according to Carol Dweck, it is our mindset that makes a difference. So looking at this particular slide, you can see that the boulders that I mentioned could be challenges, obstacles, effort, criticism or the success of others. But the way you deal with it could be a one of two through a fixed mindset or a growth mindset. For example, a lady that I saw um, had sent out 500 CVs and only two employees replied. Now she could have taken a fixed mindset to the situation and thought, what's the point in bothering to send out more CVs? Or worse, she may have concluded that she's unemployable. However, she had lots of relevant experience in security work, held the necessary licenses and more. So she concluded that she might need some professional help with her CV. When I saw her CV, she hadn't got a profile. She'd only listed three or four skills and hadn't even included any achievements. By the time we finished working together to enhance her CV, she could see that she had initially not done herself a justice. So that's one example of somebody who could have gone down a fixed mindset and got demoralised with that challenge, but instead embraced it, persisted and put the effort in. <clears throat> Another example is Max. He's an architect graduate who, due to the COVID pandemic, no longer had access to his university's state of the art studio equipment um, so that he could complete his final project. Instead, he had to work remotely back at the family home. So what did he do? Well, he set up a studio on the dining room table, utilised cardboard, polystyrene, strips of metal ordered from eBay and a soldering iron. Now, despite this challenge, he completed his project and degree course successfully, obtaining a first class honours degree in the process. So there's another good example of somebody who used that growth mindset to overcome that obstacle. So what other challenges has the COVID pandemic thrown up for those in the labour market? Well, according to the World Economic Forum report of 2020, the COVID pandemic induced lockdowns have, relate, have related global recession of 2020 have created a highly uncertain outlook for the labour market and accelerated the arrival of the future of work. And it also notes that skills gap continue to be high as in demand skills across jobs change in the next five years. Now you could look at this and think crumbs, I hate uncertainty and then start to think about all the potential negatives. But what does the future of work actually mean and what are the in-demand skills of the future? We'll start by looking at the future of work. In doing so, we'll take a quick um, history lesson because history tells us that things do change. So society in Britain was once very much based on agriculture. Then came the agricultural revolution, which subsequently displaced a lot of agricultural workers. These workers then found themselves becoming part of an industrial revolution through working in mines, cotton mills, etc. So what are we saying? Change is nothing new, but the career for life is probably a thing of the past and we will increasingly need to take advantage of new opportunities. A good example of that is a colleague of mine, Mary. She started working out um, with animals as a veterinary nurse. And then she went into alternative therapies before finally accessing um, a career in careers guidance. So quite um, varied um, job roles there. But looking at this slide, you can also see that there are some careers that are going or gone. The example here is coal mining, which is going and tin mining, which is pretty much gone. 
And then you've got the ones which we could describe as maybe the same but different. So we used to have people come into our houses to do the meter reading. I've got a friend who works in meter reading and he still comes along um, uh, different roads, etc. But he doesn't need to knock on the door anymore. He's got a special tool which can actually scan um, the meter um, digitally. So that's a, a the same but slightly different. You could also just say the same for retail. It's been very much the high street, but now it's going more um, uh, online. Then there's the new or accelerating careers. In this example, we have renewable energy, such as say um, solar and winds. They're relatively new, but due to climate change, they're accelerating due to um, being greatly in demand and increasingly popular. And then there is the future. And you'll notice I've put here that you graduates are the future in capitals. And why do we say that? Well, let's look at some of the skills of the future. And that's the next slide. <coughs> here we have an example, and I'm going to link this in with um, that um, growth mindset as well. But in a report by the World Economic Forum, um, creativity was identified as becoming one of the top three employment skills of the future. So that's interesting in itself, but obviously the COVID pandemic kicked in and according to an article in Luminate, the creative sector will be hit twice as hard as the wider economy in 2020. So that's that boulder or that challenge, the obstacle, etc., that we were talking about in that, um, that growth or fixed mindset. Interestingly, in that same article, it highlights that creative graduates are arguably well placed to deal with labour market uncertainty. And then it goes into detail as to how and why. So that's linking in with this growth mindset, looking at the positives, what you've got, and what you can bring to the table and how you can move that forward positively. Aside from that quick example with creativity, other skills that were listed included critical thinking, analysis, problem solving, self-management, active learning, resilience, stress tolerance, flexibility and more. All of these skills are likely skills that you will have developed through your degree studies. <coughs> so ask yourself, why would an employer be interested in me? At this point, I would be thinking about getting a pen and paper and maybe writing down a list and doing that maybe after the, to today's webinar. Reason I say that is it's OK to say that you've got certain skills, but it's always good to provide proof. So then maybe make that list of skills and qualities that you feel you've got and then start thinking about what evidence I've got to prove it. Aside from this, though, there are three things that do come to mind, and that is you can operate at degree level, You've developed your skills through your studies and you've gained new skills. <clears throat> so we'll start with the first one. What do we mean by operating at degree level? Well, employers are not always too concerned with what subjects you studied, but that you can operate at degree level. In other words, that you can cope with the rigours of graduate level training and that you have the potential to add something new and more. By way of an example, a lot of us careers advisors like myself are graduates, but the subjects studied vary. For example, in our team, we've got quite a mix, as you can see. I'm the one who studied the degree in history and sociology, but you can see my colleagues studied quite a wide variety of different subjects. Indeed, one colleague made me laugh when I'm replying to my um, quick straw poll, and she said, my geography de degree doesn't really link with careers guidance, except maybe helping me to navigate my way around Kent. Joking aside though, have a think about what skills were developed or enhanced through your degree studies. Here we have, just as an example taken from the Prospects website, that of a history graduate and the skills that they would have developed. Hopefully you can see on here that I've highlighted certain skills, um, a number of which were mentioned previously as skills of the future. They include the analytical, problem solving and self-management. However, the third thing we mentioned was that you would have developed some other skills due to the COVID situation. So this leads nicely on to our next slide. At this juncture, I'll refer back to our architectural graduate, Max. Here we have a list of some of the skills that he utilised as a result of the pandemic. We've only picked on four. There were uh, quite a number more, but we, we thought we'd just focus on a few. So we start with resilience. 
he had to be resilient because he had no access to the usual resources as we previously highlighted and he also had to get used to working remotely and he also was hearing a lot of negative um, news about the economy on the TV so quite a bit to cope with there and you had definitely have to be really resilient with that one. Adaptability, he had to adapt to virtual and online learning methods so something new there he also had to adapt to living back at home with mum and dad, having lived independently for a few years, and that can quite often um, <laughs> raise a few issues, but especially once you've been away from home and you're thinking, crumbs, I can't believe my mum and dad were like that, but <laughs> there you go. And then there's the creative thinking. As previously mentioned, he converted a dining room table into a studio and he created designs using materials that were on hand or ordered through the internet. And finally, we'll look at the digital. He was making use of um, the, the Teams um, facility that we're also making use of today. And he used that to attend lectures, seminars, as well as keeping in touch with his fellow students. But obviously, they're new um, ways of keeping in contact with people, as is Zoom, Skype and things like that. So again, it's new technologies to get used to. So that's just a few ideas, but I'm sure you sure looking at this slide, you can probably think of a lot more skills qualities that you made use of uh, along the way. However, there are times we do things so naturally that we fail to acknowledge, acknowledge certain skills attributes that we do possess. Question is, how do we go about identifying those skills? I've just got an example of the Jahari window. This might be familiar to some of you and not others, but I quite like it because it's highlighting that we like a window in a way and we've got four elements to our character. There's the blind spot, the arena, the facade and the unknown. We'll start with the unknown. That's unknown to you and others. So if your house is on fire, you rescue your pet hamster, you might suddenly be thinking, wow, I'm brave and your friends would concur. The facade. We might not feel that confident within ourselves, but um, project an image of being very self-confident and we're happy with that status quo. The arena, I'll give myself as an example. I know I'm a chatterbox, as did my friends, so that's not a massive re revelation. But that nicely leads on to this final spot, the blind spot. This is something that we do so naturally that we don't even acknowledge it as a skill or a quality, but others do. In this um, instance, <clears throat> you might want to text your family, friends and ask them to describe you in one word, nothing rude, but then you'll get a variety of replies because um, that person will be thinking, OK, I like quite a lot about you, but if I'm having to pick one particular skill or quality, I would choose X. So they'll, they'll choose one and you'll be getting a nice wide variety um, back from, from your friends and family. Now, some of them won't be a revelation. So my friend Danielle messaged me back um, chatterbox, which wasn't too much of a surprise. But another friend of mine, Andy, said honest. I asked him to expand on that because I was thinking that's an interesting one. Um, it's not one that I'd consciously thought about before. And he said, well, I'm his only friend that will take him to one side and explain why certain behavioural conversations are not socially acceptable. He struggles with this because being on the autistic spectrum, he doesn't always cotton on to social cues. So uh, he found my honesty and, and um, the friendship to be valuable because I was helping him out and helping him understand why certain things were the way they were. Now, what we'd encourage you to do is view your attributes, skills and qualities as building blocks. And this leads nicely on to the next slide. Now, you would have um, potentially built these building blocks through a range of activities. So it would be your academic studies, um, student jobs, belonging to different student societies and more. Thinking back to Max, the architectural student, he was a mentor to um, you one students whilst at university in his final year. So that could be a good example. But here you can see the building blocks could include critical thinking, problem solving, IT technical, creativity, analytical, leadership, adaptability and a whole host more. What I would say is these building blocks can be likened to Lego bricks, which as this next slide highlights, can be made into different things, a boat, a car, a train. 
So the, the key question here is what will you do with your building blocks and where will they take you? <coughs> Moving on to the next slide, we can see what a history graduate has skills wise on one side and what would be needed skills wise for a procurement manager. And you'll notice there's quite a few arrows pointing from one side to the other and um, highlighting how these skills link in with that particular job role as an example. And you'll also notice that some skills such as communication link in with more than one particular skill, for example, customer service and persuading and negotiating. However, there is another set of skills that you will need to utilize, ones that may seem a bit of a chore. And we'll move on to the next slide for that. These skills are what we call the career management skills. So we've looked at um, how your building blocks can be used um, or likened to transferable skills that link in with career options. But linked with that, we've got these career management skills. Now, some of you might be looking at these career management skills and rolling your eyes at the prospect of compiling a CV or editing a CV. But interestingly, in an article in the Luminate, it makes a point that instead of seeing the job seeking process as a chore, look at it as a project, project you, and that's key. After all, if you find your CV uninspiring, chances are an employer will do too. So be positive, dynamic, and market yourself well. You're a graduate, you've got a lot to offer, and you're the future. Looking at these different career management skills, um, we'll take, say, the labour market one. What do you know about your local labour market? Is it primarily what you've seen on the news or have you done further research? Obviously, there's been a certain level of doom and gloom on the news, but there is some good news stories in there and there are industries that are adapting and thriving. So keep an eye on them. And I think Mark made an interesting point about don't look at social media too much because sometimes it can um, make, make you feel a bit overwhelmed at times. But if you are looking, don't just look at the, the potential um, negatives, but also look at um, a positive examples. So thinking back to that um, growth mindset, there's people making a success of themselves. Look at them as somebody who is an inspiration. What can you learn from them and use that to move forward? We've also got CV writing. I've mentioned that previously, but did you know that employers spend eight or nine seconds looking at a CV? With nearly half the employers polled admitting that they spend less than six seconds. That's kind of a scary thought. So what you need to think about is, is my profile generic or targeted? It should be targeted. And have you included your achievements? And there's a whole host of other things to consider as well. Thinking about interview skills, there's a whole host of things to think about there and I'm sure your um, university careers advisor will be more than happy to provide support with this as well. Um, but you, just as a quick example, you might get a curveball question in in a job interview. And the idea of the curveball question is to um, see whether you can think on your feet, so to speak. But you might get a crazy question like if you're an animal, what an animal would you be and why? Have you started prepping your mind up to questions like that and the whole host of other um, graduate related questions that you might get in the interview? And then we'll just briefly touch on the social media. Ask yourself, am I making effective use of social media, be it LinkedIn, or am I shooting myself on the, in the foot um, as uh, unfortunately quite a number of people do on Facebook? But don't worry, like I said, there's a lot of professionals out there who can help and that would include your university careers advisors, your university lecturers can help out providing um, references for you, for example, and there's a whole host of other people who can help out too. And that includes us, the National Careers Service. I know Craig made mention of us um, right at the start, but as highlighted here, we've got a telephone and web chat facility and the details are at the top. And we are open from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday to Friday and 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. on Saturday. You'll notice there's a few tabs across the top on this example screenshot and um, there's Explore Careers Skills Assessment Finder course. 
we'd find a course you'll um, find um, the skills toolkit which is a range of free courses that you can tap into and you might might, might find them quite useful for developing your um, skills and knowledge further if you're a bit unsure about which career direction you want to go in and um, you would potentially find the skills assessment useful there's two um, versions there there's a quick fire questionnaire which takes about five or ten minutes and then there's a more detailed one um, but both kind of link in with this explore careers page where you've got over 800 different career options hidden behind 25 different career areas so it usually suggests two uh, one or two career areas for you to explore based on your preferences so that's just a, a quick example of what our web page looks like and the support we can provide talking about the um, job profiles I mentioned earlier the purchasing manager job profile or the procurement manager and um, we've got the information off our website obviously um, but this is what um, that particular job profile looks like and they're all set out exactly the same so you have average salary typical hours and when you could work and then these little tabs underneath which take you straight to how to become which is the entry routes what it takes which is the skills the knowledge that you'd need and what you'll do which is to do with <clears throat> um, your day-to-day -day, um, duties but if you do make use of our services be assured that um, we're there for you and um, that we really would do want to help and here's our customer charter um, it, it highlights our commitment to you and it includes things like the fact that we provide impartial um, uh, information and guidance and interestingly helping you to identify your strengths and skills in relation to the world of work but what I thought I'd conclude on is this little quote from Mel Robbins which reads the same boiling water that softens the potato hardens the egg essentially it's about what you're made of and how you approach things not the circumstances so the COVID pandemic is one of these circumstances or the boulder on that pathway but how you deal with it depends on whether you approach it with a fixed or a growth mindset and on that note I'll now hand you back to our chairman Mark. Hi Stephen thanks so much that was great and uh, really interesting and of course you know who could have predicted the world that we're in right now and when when you look at graduate recruiters you know adaptability flexibility willingness to take on new challenges are all going to be uppermost in people's minds so that's great a uh, really helpful reference to the prospects website i've put that into the q a um in case you're not uh, i'm sure many of you are aware of that site but just in case you're not really good source of information about skills for different jobs but also uh, skills from different degree subjects so hopefully you'll find that helpful just a reminder I did say put your questions into chat, but actually what I should have said was into Q&A. So um, that's open at the moment. There are there are one or two questions appearing, but please ask any questions throughout this morning. So we're going to move on to the next section. And um, one of the things I said at the very beginning was that university career services are um, able to support you. Um, and, and now is a time when it's it's easier than ever to get back in touch with your former careers, so, uh, former university and, and talk to the career service there. Um, so um, we've, I'm delighted that we're being joined by three different universities as examples of the kind of support that universities provide. This will vary from university to university, but um, as I think you might be, to see, uh, I'm not sure if you can see that slide, but we're going to be joined by colleague by, by Maria from Leeds Beckett. We've got a colleague from Bristol and Birmingham City University. And, and as as I've just said, if you've got any questions coming up from this, please just put them into Q&A. We'll either answer them as we go along or we'll sort, we'll save them up. Uh, so I'm delighted to hand over to our next speaker, who is Maria Dobranska from Leeds Beckett. And actually, Maria, I don't know if you probably you won't know this, but my daughter went to Leeds Beckett, so um, I will be taking copious notes. <laughs> so well placed, well placed. Hopefully everyone can can see my slides. Do let me know if that's not the case. 
Um, I'm delighted to be with you all this morning. As Mark said, I'm Maria Dobronska and I am a careers consultant at Leeds Beckett University and I'm here today to really map out the way that we support our graduates moving beyond Beckett. But just a note to you as we begin this presentation is that most of the support, most of the initiatives that I highlight during this presentation are actually quite typical of support and initiatives that exist to support graduates at most universities across the UK. So the key messages as I get going is connect back to your university and start to explore what's on offer to you. And I hope through this presentation you'll go away with some inspiration and new ideas on ways through which universities might support you that you'd not actually realised. So specifically through this presentation, I really want to highlight to you the ways that our, our career service at Leeds Beckett University has adapted to the challenges presented by COVID-19. And I want to really discuss some of the new opportunities that COVID-19 has presented to us as a career service and how actually through moving into online delivery, we're now able to offer an enhanced level of support to our graduates. So it's a real good news story um, for our graduate community. Community. One of the key ways that moving to online delivery because of COVID-19 has, has allowed us to improve and allowed us to enhance the level of support available to our graduate community is through the range of employers that we are now able to connect our graduates to. So previously at our university, a lot of our employer events that we would host um, were actually delivered physically. So we would book a room and host an employer and invite our graduates along to attend but that didn't always work because our graduates may have moved away, they may have got jobs and it, it wasn't the best way to perhaps connect our graduates to employers who have jobs available for them to consider and advice. So moving into an online world has helped graduates in terms of accessibility, but it also means that we're now able to connect our graduates with a wider pool of employers who quite similarly experience ge geographical limitations to you know, what university Universities they could they could work with. Um, so we've really seen a rise in the number of employers contacting us to work with us who actually want to connect with with graduates and use our service to do that. Um, so it's really important to to tap into some of the employer events that are being hosted by your university. And another good news message for you is that we're seeing a huge array of different types of work opportunities coming through um, for our graduates. So as you might expect, a rise in the number of virtual opportunities, so home based opportunities, meaning that there are there are boundaries and barriers that have been broken down in terms of where you can work and who you can work with. Employers we're seeing are adopting a much more flexible approach to working and particularly the employers that, that we're working with are telling us that they don't expect to, to go back um, to the old fashioned way of the nine to five, um, which is perhaps how some of them were operating before the COVID outbreak. Um, so it has opened new doors for our our graduates, particularly in terms of the employers that we are now able to connect our graduate communities with. And that's probably similar for most universities across the country. Now at Leeds Beckett, we very much see ourselves as an anchor institution. So two thirds of our students are actually come from our, our region. They're actually living in our region already. And the majority of those students actually want to remain in the region to work with. So we're quite unique um, compared to some of the other universities in our city in that most of our students actually want to stay in Leeds. 
And as such, we see it as a civic responsibility to our city to connect our graduates into our local economy and thereby contribute to our region's economic prosperity. So we have a real focus at Leeds Beckett on connecting students to employers in Leeds. And this is really important for you if you are wanting to stay in the region where, where you studied, as it's likely that your university will also have initiatives running that are designed to connect you with employers on your doorstep. Now, an example of one of the initiatives that, that we run at Leeds Beckett is called the In Leeds project and through that project we work with other universities across our city so we work with the University of Leeds and Leeds Trinity University we work with lo local authorities Leeds City Council and we work with our LEP which is our local economic body so and we do that to bring together um, a pool of our graduates right across the city and what we do is we connect those graduates with employers who have opportunities, live opportunities. So this event, this In Leeds initiative is actually happening next week and it is designed to showcase our graduates opportunities available with SMEs so small to medium enterprises that they might not have heard of before or might not have considered before um, but those organisations have live opportunities and really the purpose of that is to connect our graduates into employers in the city who actually want to hire graduates. We're also running funded graduate internships and the purpose of those is to support businesses again in our local economy to rebuild. So we see it as our civic responsibility, as I've said, to support our local economy and connect our graduates into the local economy. And those funded graduate internships offer our graduates a wage and they offer local businesses the incentive um, that they need in these really challenging times to take on new talent um, because we recognise that new talent is is what is necessary to help these businesses to rebuild. We also showcase um, new areas of work to our graduates that they might not have considered before. So we run a range of professional development programmes that are really focused on industries where we're seeing a high level of growth. So, for example, in Leeds, we're seeing a high level of growth in the number of jobs in digital and tech. And we run programmes for students from, that studied any degree discipline that allow those students to come along, gain insights into that industry that they might not have considered before connect with employers and upskill to make themselves attractive to employers in an industry that perhaps they may not have been on their radar ordinarily. And not to forget, we also offer startup support to students that are wanting to work on a freelance basis or wanting to set up their own businesses. So we have a business incubator at our university that is really there to, to support new startups. And we're also connected with other organisations in the city that offer that support to startups. And we can see this area as being a real area of growth moving forward. And it's an area that we as a university and as a career service are expanding in and the level of support that we offer to students that are interested in starting up their own business is growing um, and is likely to change and adapt moving forward during the next 12 months. As I said at the start of the presentation, the ways that we're able to support graduates have improved um, because of the way that we've moved into online delivery. We have specific platforms that are dedicated to our graduate community and these online platforms offer personalised tools to support you no matter where you are in your career journey. And that's important to remember because university career services aren't just here to support graduates who are currently seeking work, we're also here to support graduates in progressing in their career. So some of our online tools are great in terms of helping you to take the next steps, whether that's a promotion, whether that's upskilling in a certain area. So remember that your career service is are able to offer a multitude of, of support to you no matter where you are at. 
And like most other universities, we have made significant investments in our technology and the, they really have these tools that we have available. I really have moved on a level or two in the last year. Um, so do access the online support that, that is offered to you via your university. And like I said, there is now a much greater level of flexibility for you as a graduate in terms of accessing events, online courses because they are accessible to you wherever you are now and many will be recorded and available to you on a demand basis. At Leeds Beckett we also offer our graduates career coaching so there is that one-to-one -one support as well it's not all online if you want to speak to somebody you can and it's not just a one-off conversation we offer coaching opportunities for graduates to give them that long-term support to move them to where they want to be and one way to wrap up my presentation that I would suggest staying connected with your university is via social media. At Leeds Beckett we are operating in a much more agile fashion. We are responsive to the changes that we are seeing in the labour market and that means that we are turning events around, turning initiatives around really quickly. So to stay up to date with what's happening at your university in the careers team and to make sure you're not missing out on anything as a graduate one of the best ways to connect with them is probably by their social media accounts most universities will have a specific social media account for their careers team and it's a really easy way to stay up to date with initiatives that are open to you as a graduate so I hope that's given you some insights into the ways that universities might be able to support you and I hope it's encouraged you to stay connected with your careers team. So thanks very much for your time today. I'm delighted to hand over to Gareth Hughes now at Bristol University. Oh, you're, you're on mute Gareth. Hello everyone, uh, so my name is Gareth Hughes and uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm the Graduate Careers Consultant at the University of Bristol. So I'm going to share my slides with you now and give you an overview of the type of graduate career support that people can benefit from here at Bristol. Okay, I think everyone can see my slides now, can they? Fantastic. Uh, so I'm the Graduate Careers Consultant and I work exclusively with graduates here at the University of Bristol. So my time is entirely dedicated to making sure that people can get to where they want to be now that they've graduated. And at Bristol, we really see the main purpose of the career service as being here, and it's summed up in this sentence, to help students get to where they want to be when they graduate, whatever that might be. And to achieve this, we offer a wide range of support to everyone uh, to help them with every stage of their career planning. Uh, and when we say students, we really do mean all students. So no matter what type of course our students are studying or what type of background they come from, we're here to help them by providing personalised support that meets their needs. So as you can see in this list, I've also listed graduates. Now, many of these students will manage to get something lined up for after their degree finishes, a job or further study that they'll go straight into. But we know there's a very large number who benefit from support after they graduate to help them get their careers started. And this is becoming even more apparent in the current climate as finding and applying for work has just become so much more challenging. And a lot of graduates have had to really rethink their career plans due to the impact that COVID's had on the industry they were aiming for. So this additional graduate support has become much, much more important. So I'm going to focus in on how we support graduates here at Bristol and the support they receive from Bristol doesn't end upon graduation. Our graduates are still able to access a wide range of our the whole university services and as the career service we pledge to support everyone who studied here with their career planning for up to three years after they finish their course wherever they are in the world. Uh, so here are our key messages to our graduates that we're still here for three years. It's one of the main things that we want to make sure our graduates know alongside the fact that we will help them no matter what stage they're at in their career planning by offering support with career decision making, CVs, applications, interviews, anything at all. And then also finally that we believe in them and we want to help them get to where they want to be. 
So how do we help them? These are some of the main things that we really focus on. This additional support we give after graduation can really help give people a fresh start. And they also get enhanced career support for the first year after graduation. So we really pour all of our resources into helping people take that first step. We'll help them with a confidence boost to give them reassurance. We'll give them some structure because it can be so much more challenging doing this on your own if you don't know what you're doing. So we'll help give that structure to their career planning and help them make progress. We'll give practical help to overcome specific obstacles. And some of the things I'll talk you through now are access to unique paid work experience opportunities, all of our careers resources, our alumni network, our fortnightly careers newsletter, and much, much more. So one of the main things I do is offer hundreds of appointments to our graduates to help them move on in their career planning, uh, which starts off with focusing on finding those who really need our support. And we have some of this information through something that we do at the end of the year called our Before You Go survey, where we ask graduates who are about to leave what their career plans are. But we also supplement it by looking at those who've never engaged with the career service before or those who are graduating from courses where their job prospects have been particularly badly hit by COVID and, and lots of other factors. And then this then leads to a huge phone calling and emailing campaign to try and make contact with as many graduates as possible to tell them about our support package and also find out who it is that needs help to get them booked into one of our appointments. So they're then booked into our 30 minute graduate guidance appointments, which can end up talking about anything really, all variety of things. But the main point of them is to really listen to the graduates and focus it around exactly what support they need to move forward. And at the end of the appointment, I help them identify what their next steps might be and then follow up with them after a month or so to find out how things are going, whether they've made progress, whether they need more support and have another conversation to just keep that moving. So we're there to continually support them all the way through. And the range of topics I discuss is absolutely huge. I've put a few examples there on the slide, but it discusses for, uh, it ranges from discussing things like uh, people who are just starting to think about what they want to do, people who've got their place on a graduate scheme, but after a few months have decided that it's not the career for them, helping them with CVs. It's all very graduate focused, making sure that we give them the support that they need and empowering them to move forward. So I thought I'd quickly give you a case study of one graduate we supported, and this is a Eugenia Luke who studied at Bristol and graduated in 2018. Now, after graduation, she was initially seeking a career in consultancy, which is quite common, uh, but her applications had been unsuccessful. She was getting very frustrated and had become disillusioned completely with that career choice and wanted help to explore some other options. So we discussed and investigated roles beyond consultancy and identified her main skills and interests and what she wanted to work on. And through that, we identified an interest in teaching. And running with this, we helped her explore different routes into teaching, which one might be best, which one would make the best use of her skills, where she might fit. And we identified that Teach First might be the best one for her. So we supported her to put together a strong CV, got her through to the assessment centre, helped her prepare for that. And after she was successful in receiving a job offer from Teach First, uh, which she started the following September, we also had further appointments to make sure she was feeling confident about starting, talking about how she can get ready for starting work to make sure that she could hit the ground running. So we took her all the way from I'm lost, I don't know what to do, right to her first day of work. But of course, graduates get access to much more than just appointments here at Bristol, and they have access to our full range of support, all of which is accessible through our online platform, which is called My Career, which they retain access to, as I said, for up to three years after they've graduated. Graduates can book appointments through My Career, but here they can also find all of our events, such as workshops, information sessions, careers fairs, employer talks, and much, much more. And graduates have always been welcome to attend any of our events in person, but as most of them are not in the Bristol area, uh, it was much more challenging for them to do that. So I used to run a selection of webinars covering key topics like CVs, interviews and work experience. But because of the change of circumstances over the past year, we've completely changed the way that we work. And all of the events that we would have traditionally run face to face are now entirely online, which means that absolutely everything that we do is equally as accessible to graduates as it is to students. So we always have lots of events coming up and here you can see just a sample of some of those that are currently live on our system. Uh, and as you can see on the right hand side, they can easily search and filter their event based on what their current need is. 
our flagship events had always been our career fairs. So graduates, again, were always welcome to come back and attend our fairs. And in fact, we were able to offer a contrib contribution towards their travel costs. But coming back to Bristol was always a challenge for most of them. But this year, our careers fairs have become impossible to run in the way that they used to, which means they, like everything else, have moved entirely online, which saw in autumn 2020, us put on a series of virtual events which replace the usual promotional employer talks completely. And we increased use of our careers fair app, which provided a platform for students and graduates to have one to one conversations with hundreds of employers, learn about graduate schemes, ask questions. We had webinars, panel events. I've got a screenshot from where we had Amazon come along to talk about how to apply. And now that all of our events have moved online, graduates are able to attend just as easily and really make the most of the opportunity to connect with employers directly. Now, on my career, we also have our jobs board, which hosts hundreds of vacancies. But in order to help graduates find work quickly, we've added a specific category, which is graduate vacancies with an immediate start date, which means they can filter straight away things that employers are advertising where they want someone to start as soon as possible and filter out any of those graduate schemes that might not be starting for several months. Now, all of the employers who attend the fairs that I just talked about advertise through our online portal. So it's yet another way that graduates can continue to connect with employers online now that the face-to-face -face opportunities have become impossible. And through this board, graduates can also access one of the main ways that we can help them get our, their career started, which is our SME internship scheme. So these are high quality, fully paid work experience opportunities, which are full time for one month, and they're organized by the career service, advertised only to Bristol students and graduates. And they take place primarily in the southwest, but can take place anywhere in the country, wherever our graduate might be based. And the important thing is these have not been stopped by COVID. We've decided to change it and they're now all taking place online and uh, allow remote working. So our internships cover a wide range of industries, so graduates are sure to find one that will help them with their career plan. Uh, but if they don't find one that's filling that meets their interest area, we hold some of that funding back to make it available to graduates so they can find an employer they're interested in working for and create their own internship opportunity that we will help them fund. And these are a great way to get started in a career, gain relevant experience, build connections and have led to many permanent uh, graduates being taken on on a permanent basis. Now, all the details of our internship scheme are available through the resources section of my career, which you can see on the screen now, which has a massive amount of e-learning content covering every single careers topic that you can think of. It's got articles, videos, activities, help with choosing your career, how to prepare for your first day as a new job. But two of the most important resources that we have are CV360 and Interview360. Now, CV360 is a tool that will help you quickly build a well-structured CV that has the right information in an easy to read format. That's got a built-in CV reviewer that will use AI to check it against several things that employers are looking for and give you specific pointers and a score out of 100 so that you can make some very, very specific, easy switches to make sure that your CV is one of those that gets looked at again when the employers are, do, are looking at it for six seconds, as we said slightly earlier in, in the webinar. And now we've also got Interview360, which is our online video in interview simulator, which is preloaded with over 100 questions that graduates can practice and they can watch themselves back, see how they perform, check it against things that employers are, are looking for. And it's a great way to prepare for video interviews, which I'm sure, as we all know, have become in absolutely fundamental to help it to getting a job. But the sheer number of resources that we have can sometimes be overwhelming. So our newest offer is our interactive e-learning course called our Career Ready course. So this is a course where students and graduates can choose the pathway that's most relevant for their stage of career planning. And they'll be presented with a really carefully curated selection of resources that we think are the most important and useful for them, including both three interview 360 and CV 360, which are all organized as a short online course supplemented with videos and activities to help them move forward. And um, one of the great things about taking this new approach over the past year is how much more we're able to provide career support available to graduates and st students and graduates wherever they are and whenever they need it. So not just during the hours of nine to five when the career service is open, they can access it at any time whenever they need to get that information. And in addition to our own resources, we work very, very closely with other departments and organizations to make sure the support package we provide is as comprehensive as possible. So one example is the Alumni Relations Office at the university. Um, part of the work that we do with the Alumni Relations Office includes something called Bristol Connects. 
which is an online platform exclusive to Bristol students and alumni and allows them to easily find and connect with each other all over the world. Uh, here's what it looks like. And one of the key features of this is that older alumni can identify themselves as career experts and offer support which allows students and graduates to easily search for people who are in a position to help them. And they also run a fantastic series of online industry insight events called Bristol Connects Live, where we get a panel of alumni from all over the world to talk to graduates about their career paths. It's a great way to connect with other alumni and feel part of the larger Bristol alumni community. Uh, we've got other people we've connected with are, are Bristol Mind uh, to help provide mental health support because we know the current situation is very challenging and also the Transform Society Alliance, which is an alliance of the some of the largest public sector organisations, which you can see on the screen now, uh, including Frontline and Teach First. And through this, we organise work experience, connect graduates with mentors, uh, application support, work experience, a whole host of things. So if you want to get in contact with us, if you are a Bristol graduate, then the easiest way to do that is on the Career Service website, which you can see on the screen now. Uh, click on the live chat, which will take you through to this screen where you can speak directly to a member of the Career Service and get an instant answer to any of your questions, as well as access all of our online support. So thank you for listening to me. I really, really appreciate the opportunity to tell you about what Bristol uh, offers for graduates. I'm now gonna hand over to Joe Howell from Birmingham City University. You're on, Joe. Lovely, thank you. Um, I tell you what, it's absolutely fantastic listening to um, all the great activities that go on with the universities um, to support our graduates at the moment. I think we appreciate it is challenging for people, but actually the amount of support is, is absolutely fantastic. And I'm delighted to be part of this presentation today, talking about how we support our graduates at Birmingham City University. So I'm going to share my screen now so you can see a little bit more about it. Lovely, hopefully you can all see this. So uh, obviously my name is uh, Joe Howell. I'm the uh, head of careers at Birmingham City University. So over the last few years, we've been developing and improving our services to our graduates. And it's great to have the opportunity to share these with you. The services we offer for graduates offer up to three years after completing their degrees. Like most universities, we are currently delivering our services remotely, which is working really well. And I anticipate in the future, we will be offering a mix of face-to-face -face and remote services to students and graduates. I'm now going to run through the services we offer, many of which are likely to be available at other universities across the country, and they can broadly be split into three themes, all of which are available to BCU graduates. So these include advice and guidance, opportunities to meet and network with employers and gain work experience, and other opportunities. So firstly, I'd like to mention our team of career consultants. They specialise in different industrial areas and have the skills and expertise to help you identify your skills, strengths and interests and the wide range of roles they are relevant for, including careers you may not have considered previously. Many careers are open to graduates from all disciplines and the key is in identifying your transferable skills and demonstrating how they are relevant to the role you are applying for. They can also help you identify career pathways and the steps you can take to move into your dream job if it feels out of reach at the moment. We also have a team of graduate employment advisors who are specialists in understanding the job market, where jobs are advertised and the hidden jobs and how to find them. They have years of experience of working with employers and graduates and understand how to help you write CVs that will stand out and LinkedIn profiles that will get noticed. They also support our graduates with completing job application forms and can give advice on performing well in psychometric tests, which are used by many graduate employers. Once you've been shortlisted for a job, they can then provide support with preparing for interviews, whether these are in person or remotely via Zoom or MS Teams. This includes considering the questions that you are likely to be asked, preparing questions to ask the panel and also carrying out practice interviews. We also have video interviewing software to enable you to practice for an interview at a time to suit you and watch your practice interview afterwards. 
Over the last few months, our graduate employment advisors have supported over 500 BCU graduates in gaining employment. At BCU, we also provide services to graduates as part of our Graduate Retune project. This is an OFS funded project run in partnership with Aston University, the Department of Work and Pensions and Birmingham and Solihull Job Centre Plus. This project provides specialist services to graduates who require in-depth support or who have specific barriers to gaining employment. It is available to graduates who are registered with Birmingham and Solihull Job Centre Plus and includes all graduates, not just those who studied at BCU or Aston University. In addition to the advice you can receive from BCU Careers and Employment Specialists, we also have an extensive range we have an extensive website for our graduates. This is available 24 seven and has lots of useful information, short films and links to other helpful resources. It also has direct links to our Careers Plus events pages, appointments booking system and online job board, which I will talk about shortly. Our BCU jobs board has a wide range of jobs and internship opportunities and is available on our Careers Plus website. It includes jobs from employers who have asked us to advertise their jobs to BCU students and graduates, and also some where employers have asked us to directly support them with their recruitment, essentially to advertise and shortlist suitable graduates for their roles. In addition, the Jobs Board includes many of the jobs advertised on Target Jobs, one of the main graduate jobs websites. With the Jobs Board, you can search by industry, job role, location and salary and receive job alerts when suitable jobs are advertised. One of the benefits of the current situation is that with the development of remote working, company location is less relevant as there are increasing opportunities to work from home. So I would encourage you to apply for a job that you really wanted, even if it is advertised as being based far away, as you may be able to work remotely for some or all of the time. We also hold regular events with employers and these have traditionally been carried out on campus but are now taking place remotely via Teams. These give employers opportunities to meet with graduates, talk about the roles they have, the skills and experience they are looking for and more information on what it is like to work for the company. Graduates benefit from finding out more about what the employer is looking for, check the job is right for them enables them to create better applications and improve their chances of performing well in interviews. Speed networking events are really quite fun. During these events, employers and graduates will meet individually for five minutes. The employer talks about the opportunity, the graduate talks about their skills and how they could be suitable, and then they move on to the next. This has worked really well and led to several job offers and graduates starting work. At BCU, we recognise the importance of relevant work experience and many of our students work part time whilst they study. However, some lack relevant experience for the roles they are interested in. Over the past three years, we have offered paid micro placements to our students and paid internships for our graduates. The roles have typically lasted between four and 12 weeks and have taken place with local employers or with departments within BCU. These have been really successful with many graduates continuing with their employers once their internship has finished. As a university, we really benefit from employing our graduates as they bring real energy, enthusiasm and fresh ideas. And I personally love working with them. They inspire me every day. We also run a volunteering programme for graduates who are looking to gain skills and experience in new areas. We work with a number of large and small local and national charities and third sector organisations and advertise their opportunities. This is a great way of gaining experience if you have limited work experience and lack confidence. The roles are often quite flexible and support and training is given. It can also lead to paid work with the charity. We also have a regular jobs bulletin that is sent out to our graduates and roles are often advertised on our Twitter and LinkedIn pages. It's definitely worth following the accounts and staff of University Career Services, particularly for jobs that have a quick turnaround and short closing date. 
There are also a range of other opportunities open to our graduates. Our mentoring scheme is open to final year students and recent graduates. Our graduates can register and let us know the industry they are keen to work in. Our mentoring advisor will then match them to a local professional who has signed up for our programme. They can share their experience, will give industry insights and often provide opportunity to visit their company for an industry day. This is a really valuable way of developing your network of professional contacts who may be able to help you with your future career and share information about jobs they hear about through their networks. At BCU, we have a Graduate Plus Award, which helps you recognise and articulate the skills you develop in your degree and in extracurricular activities. This is available to our graduates as well, so you can include any training and experience that you gain post-graduation towards your award. Graduates also have access to our STEM Up programme, which includes free creative and technical training leading to certificates and accreditation. In addition, our STEAM House, Business Incubator and BSEAM projects can all support graduates who are considering setting up or are in the early stages of setting up their own businesses. The schemes provide support and premises during the early stages of business creation. All students and BCU graduates have access to LinkedIn Learning. This is well worth engaging in. LinkedIn is doing some really interesting work on tracking career pathways following training, and this can lead to jobs being promoted to you after you have completed certain types of training. A number of events are organised at BCU and are open to our graduates. This includes guest speakers and alumni returning to talk about their career journey, their current role and industry. This is a great way of developing and expanding your networks. If you do attend events, always connect with speakers and presenters on LinkedIn afterwards and say how much you enjoyed their presentation. You never know where it might lead. We encourage all our students and graduates to take responsibility for create, creating an online brand as employers are increasingly using social media and online platforms like LinkedIn in their recruitment strategies. Keep it professional and like and follow inspiring people and people doing jobs you want to do and companies you would like to work for. Roles are increasingly being advertised in this way as they can reach a wide audience and it is free for an organisation. So that was a quick overview of the career support available at BCU for our graduates. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Joe, that was great. Thank you so much. Um, also, Maria and Gareth, um, there is so much support from your university career services and hopefully the examples that Joe, Gareth and uh, Maria have given will show, have, have, have demonstrated that really well. Um, if you haven't already been in touch with your university, please, please do so. I think that's the advice that's coming across. Also, the kind of accessibility now more than ever. Um, you know, I've picked up, I've, I've heard about projects to link graduates with regional employers, paid internships, examples where it's not just about getting a job, but it's also about career coaching for, for career progression. It's about advice for starting businesses, examples of online tools, you know, that you can access 24 seven, um, one to one support. Um, I think importantly and, I, and Joe and Maria and Gareth have illustrated this really well follow the, your career services on social media and attend events because um, you know they're, they're, they're open to you um, just a reminder if you've got any questions for any of our speakers please post them into Q&A and we will pick them up uh, later on uh, but in a uh, packed agenda so we're going to move on and I'm really delighted that our next speaker Dominic Hilliard is going, he's the head of executive search and talent leadership consultancy rethink group. And he's going to talk about the hidden job market. And one of the things that, you know, I'm, well, I don't want to steal Dominic's thunder, but it's interesting that only 20% of jobs are ever advertised and 80% of jobs are actually hidden. And I'm sure that's going to be what's going to come across in the next, in the next uh, 20 minutes or so. So Dominic, over to you. 
Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. Uh, and a very, very warm welcome uh, to you all. Um, you've stolen most of my presentation there <laughs> with, with the facts. Just wanted just to check that everyone's able to see my, my slides at the moment. Yes, all good, John. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Um, yeah, hi. As Mark sort of said, I'm I'm Dominic Hilliard. Um, I'm a director of um, recruitment projects uh, around the sort of digital and tech space for RTM, which is part of the Rethink Group. Uh, we're a global talent and uh, recruitment business. Um, what I want to sort of overview really today is much more around the hidden market and how to really sort of demystify how uh, demystify that, but also how to really optimise your chances in terms of looking for opportunity in this space. Now, as Mark sort of indicated uh, just now, I don't know if you knew this, um, just bear with me. Um, in terms of defining the hidden market, um, surveys regularly show that upwards of 80% of all job opportunities don't actually reach the open market, which is really um, the areas that most people are able to sort of access opportunities. Most of them are filled through lots of different ways, you know, referrals, recommendations, um, and this is really what the, the hidden market is all about. Uh, and what I want to talk about is really how you can optimise your chances here. So the four, there are four things really to, to consider um, uh, currently in terms of uh, looking at this uh, variable. The first thing is really psychology, and I think you know a lot of people have talked about this earlier today, but the really most important thing is your own personal psychology. Start with really try and be as positive as you as you can. And before you look at what you do or how or, or who you do that with, that it's really, really important to, to connect your why what you're all about and why you actually do things I think is absolutely critically important. Um, there's some great stuff uh, uh, in the open market around um, this, particularly with um, people like Simon Sinek and so on and so forth. So once you connect with your why, then you'll, you'll be able, everything else will hopefully fall into, into place. The other thing is around resilience, which I think a lot of people have talked about earlier. Um, resilience, I mean, it's a very impersonal process looking for opportunity. Um, uh, currently, but it is really personal for yourself, so it's really just being doggedly determined. Um, the uh, a couple of variables to sort of also be aware of with regards to open market and this this uh, I was going to sort of raise a few questions but the first question is really what is the average number of applications per vacancy uh, now it is alarmingly high at the moment uh, and certainly in digital and tech um, it is on average around 800 which is a phenomenal sort of number to sort of think about um, so if you went into an open market application then there is you have a one in 800 chance currently the, the other thing is really what is the average time between a role being released and then closed off to shortlist um, and, and that's really a lot of people talk about that um, being sort of several weeks and so on and so forth in, in open market currently with the way that the recruitment works, uh, the recruitment um, agency world works. Uh, it's often less than three hours. So if you're applying, for instance, for jobs overnight or you have lots of alerts, um, you've probably missed the cut if you've applied 24 hours later. So you need to be in that real time sort of moment, I think, if you're going to play the open market. Uh, I think a lot of people have mentioned this earlier as well, the, the average reading time on a CV. So it's really some great points earlier about project you and your personal brand uh, and to get that really absolutely right. Um, the average reading time, I think the REC released fairly recently, is less than 10 seconds. So to be able to have that level of impact is really, really important. Just going to move on to some sort of top tips um, that we would sort of recommend sort of considering. Um, we've talked about sort of positive psychology already. Uh, really, I think it's around why you can do things and really focus on your key strengths. Um, a lot of people that we deal with across industry, that the key thing that sort of is a common pattern that people struggle with is really confidence. And the quickest way to get to confidence is really start looking at what your key attributes are and evidencing them. So the more evidence you have of what you are, I think is really, really important. Um, there's a lot of fantastic advice already here that, that's been provided today, which is absolutely outstanding. And I think it's quite a vulnerable thing to go out and ask for advice, but it's really, really important to reach out and help, try and get help from a variety of people and find out what, what they would do if they were you, who they would recommend. Um, it's really, really important. Very often, um, a lot of opportunity is very, very close to people. It's really through people that they know or, they, uh, or people that they know. So it's worth doing that for sure. Um, the other thing is really to make a plan, and I think we sort of talked about earlier about Project U. Failing to prepare is a prayer and to fail. So it's really, really important to look at this as a project and a campaign. Um, so lots and lots of things that you need to be sort of thinking about there. Um, 
starting uh, with regards to the networking side um, a lot of people talk about networking but most people don't do it particularly well so this is all around sort of um, direct approaching creating your own luck for yourself um, extending your network and really thinking about a whole sort of campaign for yourself um, this is around um, adopting a multi pronged approach. It's not just one simple way of looking for opportunity out there. It's really, really important to use a number of things like open market, closed market, hidden market, direct approaching, um, looking through your network. There's a variety of things you can be doing and be doing well. Um, the helping others to, to help yourself. Um, I think that's really, really important. Also, most people um, do this. Um, most very successful people do this and really what that does is it makes people luckier and it gets them access to opportunities. Um, the other thing is to monitor your progress so don't give up and think of this as a campaign so momentum is really really important but review what's been working what hasn't been working and then refine your approach. We talked earlier about sort of persistence and I think that's really 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 important um, as momentum is absolutely key and then finally um, I'm just trying to see, it's really about being proactive. So take personal ownership of your search. Um, effort equals reward. So if you really, really have a direct campaign, multi pronged approach to this, um, then you know, the luckier you'll get and you'll be surprised at how much opportunity may have come your way. And that's it. So um, just a quick overview of a few things there. I have um, released a document um, that I'm more than happy to share that goes into things in a bit more detail, uh, but hopefully that gives you a bit of a flavour of some of the things and variables you need to be thinking about with regards to hidden market and some of the tactics you can use to, to make it work for you. So without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Mark. Thank you very much for your time. Dominic, great. Thank you so much. It's, uh, it's a really important part of the job market and a part of the job market is often overlooked and uh, people look at the advertised jobs and, and think that's it. But there are so many more opportunities. So thanks for the kind of tips and a uh, reminder, if you've got any questions for Dominic or any of our speakers, just put them into the Q&A and we are really uh, we're, we'll put those forward uh, at the end of this morning's session. Uh, but now I'm really delighted to pass over to Will Vernon, who is the founder of the Young Professionals Network. And what Will's going to talk to us about for 10 minutes or so is becoming a young professional. So Will, over to you. Brilliant, thanks Mark um, for the introduction. Um, I'll quickly just put my slides up. Um, so you've heard a lot today about um, the tools available to uh, to graduates um, and there's an absolutely phenomenal amount of tools that I didn't know existed um, and actually what I wanted to talk to you today is is actually the other side of becoming a young professional because there's a lot of um, personal um, and hidden um, surprises that, that come with moving from a formalized educational environment um, to a professional setting. Um, so just as a quick, who am I? Um, so I graduated in, in 2014 um, from the University of Leeds. Uh, I have six years uh, experience in my career over two jobs, uh, and the two jobs point is important, and which I'll touch on later. Uh, I'm also a board member on CXK, so working with Craig and Dominic, uh, and head of uh, the performance and quality um, division there. Personally, I'm like a lot of people, love sports, I sing in a choir, I'm an environmentalist. Um, so again, broad range of uh, uh, a broad range of hobbies and interests um, and I'm also continually looking to progress my career. Um, so a couple of objectives today, um, I won't go in, into too much depth, um, but kind of hopefully you get four key points um, away from today uh, and I'll continue. So this is a scene from the office, uh, the, the US office, uh, where there's a fire alarm and everyone knows in the fire alarm to walk out to the nearest exit nice and calmly. Michael Scott, the boss, uh, starts screaming, everybody stay calm, there's a fire, and basically everyone starts to panic. Um, and that's how I felt when I was graduating. Um, I had no graduate scheme, uh, and a lot of my friends did. I had no idea about what I wanted to do at the time. Uh, and also, as, as has been mentioned before, I was living back home with my parents. So the independence I had spent three years um, growing uh, then kind of got taken away. Um, so 
you have the panic. I think everyone has it at some point and it's OK. Um, but I think what makes the most successful candidates and graduates is how you move on from that point of panic. So the first question I asked myself was, who am I? So using that energy, so using the energy of fear and replacing it with curiosity. So the two main points here on the who am I is externally looking at yourself. So understanding what's out there and using the fantastic tools that have been discussed today. And um, also what's been discussed today is looking internally as well. What drives you as an individual? Um, so is it money? Is it uh, a desire to help others? Um, and for me personally, it was to be in a people industry. Um, have a look at different companies, lots of different companies, a bit similar to management consulting, uh, and also to be as part of a, a social industry as well. Uh, and the insurance industry may not seem very glamorous on the surface, um, but it ticked all those boxes, uh, which was absolutely wonderful for me. So that then gave me a focus. Uh, and sometimes it's about not knowing what you want, but not uh, knowing what you don't want to help cut down those, um, cut down the, the options available. And this has been mentioned a lot today. Treat yourself like a project. So have the end goal, um, which is ultimately you finding a career. It could be anything and then backcast that. So what I mean by backcasting is have set goals, smaller goals within that to then build up using the Lego blocks idea that was mentioned by by Stephen earlier um, to help build up you as a person. Um, so for me, that was first of all, finding a job locally in Tunbridge Wells to have an income that kept me in work. And I know for me, that I find a job when I'm in a job much more easily than trying to find a job when I'm sat at home, um, not in a job. Because also it gave me an income um, to go out and socialise as well uh, when we could socialise. Uh, and that was really important to me. Um, and finally, use your contacts for support and guidance. So we'll touch on it uh, on the next slide, but it's amazing when you start scratching the surface of what uh, your parents and your parents, friends and your family members and family friends about what they all do. Because I think when you're growing up, certainly for me, uh, it was a case of not really understanding what anyone did. Um, so not understanding what my dad did, not understanding what uh, my godfather did. But as soon as you start asking a, a different type of question, um, you really find out that these people can be uh, very uh, quite wise actually um, and they've been in the same position as you were uh, 20 years ago but fundamentally it doesn't change um, the, the process doesn't change yes it's moved uh, during covid times from meeting in person to online but being yourself um, knowing the right people and knowing where to go they've not changed throughout the history of, of careers um, so once you've moved from fear to using that energy um, elsewhere what next recruiters. Um, again, I'm, I'm not trying to replicate what Dom said previously, but it is it is their job to get you a job. Um, as long as you are clear with what you want, um, it is within their interests um, financially for them in their career to help place you. So as long as you're clear with a recruiter, um, they will give you options that you probably didn't know existed before. LinkedIn, uh, absolutely great tool. Um, I am completely uh, uh, an advocate of it. I add when I have an interest, for example, and um, so recently it was in InsureTech, so uh, operationally improving the insurance industry. Um, I found out who had won the most recent awards and found the guy who was the head of development on LinkedIn, sent him a quick message saying I'm really interested uh, in having a conversation Had a half hour conversation with him. And now my entire uh, knowledge of that industry is so much broader than it was before. Um, and that helps me in my day to day and also with with my career as a grad. Um, it also helps to give a flavor of what the day to day job is like speaking to someone who's in that job um, allows you to to know what happens with actually having a job. Uh, National Career Service and, and ADCAS and all of your, your university career services. Um, that is not something I used actually when um, when I was looking for a career and I, I wish I had now if I'm honest with you, because of all the, the, the great options that, that they've discussed today. Um, so, yeah, please take that forward. I think it's a great option. Uh, and also listening to podcasts. There's a lot of um, industry specific podcasts out there about what's going on. And this makes you relevant to employers um, in interviews. It allows you to ask thoughtful questions. And what it does is by expanding your knowledge, even at a base level, 
uh, and getting that information, it shows that you are committed to that industry. Um, and as somebody who has hired someone into the insurance industry to, to work for me, um, that is what you want. You want the drive. You know that they're not going to be the finished product. That is my job as a manager to make you the finished product, but they have a willingness. Um, and that willingness um, is something we'll discuss on my on my next slide. So putting all those together, let's assume it's all gone swimmingly well and great. You've got your first job. Um, so there's some important things that I learned personally within my first career job, um, which I'll, I'll share with you today. So and I, I will say that this is for me personally, you don't you may work completely differently. So um, Please don't take this as, a, as gospel. Um, so what I did is I planned the first 12 months. So very similar to my job search. I looked at where I wanted to be in 12 months time and I was open about my goals. I said to my boss at the time, I said to my colleagues at the time, is this 12 months possible? If they said no, I would then still have a go at it anyway uh, because that's the type of person I am. Um, but I think, I mean, I had some managers who wanted me to plan the first 36 months in the job and I think as we've seen over the past 12 months in in the world it's very hard to predict what's going to happen in a week's time let alone 36 months time um, so I, I would strongly encourage to have those short-term goals again have a very clear, clear, clear set of objectives with your manager for you to for you to hit um, this was my favorite word in my first 12 months uh, it was yes um, what this did was it opened up lots of new opportunities for me. So what may seem like a mundane task um, actually opened up the door to uh, international travel for me, which was wonderful. So the task was to be a, a quote unquote super user. Um, well, on a well sorry to interrupt you. We can't see your slides. Can you share your screen for me, please? Apologies. Let me quickly If you just... click share. Sorry, I thought I'd done that. Uh, there we go. Can you see them now? We can, yes. Marvelous. Great. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt you. No, that's okay. Uh, right. So, quickly. So, favorite new word is, is yes. So, for me personally, that was as I was the youngest member of the team, I knew about IT, apparently, because I was young, um, and I was a super user on an international broker platform which was a lot of admin and um, yeah, it didn't seem particularly interesting. However, what that led to was um, an opportunity to travel around Europe being uh, presenting this tool to lots of other companies uh, and prospects and that was just from a simple I'll upload some data onto a system. Um, and these types of opportunities what they do is they show you as a willing participant within the team um, who, who is willing to develop and learn. Um, another word which I was told a lot in my first 12 months and wish I'd listened to the advice was patience. Um, you've graduated, you've all graduated, um, you've all, you all have fantastic qualifications, you've all worked really hard up to this point um, and it is really really tough to start again because when you start your career you're not only against uh, people in, in your own age bracket but you're up against people who are 40 years older than you as well. And it does take time um, for you to build that trust up with your manager um, for them to be able to give you the opportunity to progress forward um, in your career. And I wish I'd been more patient um, within my career. And, and, if, and if it's an issue, speak with people who've had the job before. So I spoke, I was an account administrator. I spoke to people above me who were called account managers at the time. And just to understand what the process they've been through was um, to then give you a, a sense of reality. Um, and finally, network. This is really important. Absolutely go meet people, uh, well, virtually at, at the moment, but get to understand what drives them, what they're interested in and look to build on that. So um, as Mark said, I, I helped set up the Young Professionals Network at, at my previous firm. Uh, and this was a uh, 300 people, um, uh, well, pretty much graduates were part of this network. And it was a great opportunity for me to um, be a bit of a leader. So try out some leadership skills and also get exposure to senior people. And again, more opportunities um, further on. 
by no means this is a this is not an exhaustive list. Everyone's career is different. This is um, this is just mine. But I think be mindful of these four moving forward as they, they apply to a lot of industries. Um, there's also a couple of don'ts as well. Um, so conversely to the to the word yes, I think there's always been a. Uh, I think when you're in a, a formal education system, the opportunities come at you quite often um, because you have to complete them for a module or um, they're part of a, a wider learning. But when you're not in a formal education setting, it's very much up to you to create the opportunities and, and absolutely don't expect them to, to fall at your feet. Um, one of the big points that I still struggle with is, is talking about pay. Um, it's not the easiest conversation in the world but I think again if you communicate with your manager about what your expectations are to what the company's expectations are there shouldn't be any surprises or disappointments when it comes to pay review time um, so it's absolutely a conversation that your managers had that your managers managers had and I think probably everyone who's presented today has had um, so don't treat it as something like a taboo in the room um, don't lose sight of what's important um, so whilst you may say yes to everything understand that there's actually a limit to the number of hours in the day. Um, I understand committing to your work is, is really important, but it's also really important to have that downtime, have that time socialising, do things that you enjoy outside of work so you can recharge your batteries both physically and mentally um, to be able to uh, to be able to allow you to give that that 100 percent at work. Um, and lastly, don't compare yourself with others. Um, I did this and um, I had a flatmate who was in the same industry as me, who was earning a significant amount more uh, of, a, of an income than I was. Um, and I spent a lot of wasted energy feeling upset about that rather than actually looking at myself and how I can get to the point he was at. Um, and I think, again, it's about using the energy in the right way and, and framing the conversation in a way which looks internally at yourself uh, and develops yourself rather than, um, rather than uh, wasting energy comparing yourself and others. Um, I wanted to touch briefly on leaving your first job. Um, it is something I think when you first get your uh, your first job, especially in this job market, which is incredibly tough, um, there is a sense of of owing your company um, something, and it is an emotional attachment to what is a professional relationship. Um, and what I mean by that is is you shouldn't give up what you want to do and your career progression because of someone's help you feel like someone's done you a favor previously um absolutely the career is your own um the business will help develop it and there probably will be emotional things when you leave especially if you've done a good job um however don't be afraid to communicate clearly with your manager um or whoever's in charge of you at the time about what you want from your career and if your firm cannot offer that then it shouldn't be a surprise when you move um so I think if you just bear that in mind, uh, if you want to move again, a lot of people are, uh, well, a few people now um, do spend the entire career at one company. Um, but I think if you if you treat your career, again, we'll get onto it shortly, um, like a, a growing flower in your hands, um, it is yours and yours alone uh, and understand uh, that you're in charge of it, not someone else. Um, so lastly, I wanted to, to touch on some some changes in your personal life. So these are called the Penrose Stairs, um, and this is very much what a career is like. Um, if you imagine your life up to the point of graduation is you start the year, you have modules and coursework to complete, then you complete the year with a grade. That's almost like a staircase, a, a single staircase, where, whereas a career is very different. You're constantly looking to improve. Um, this chap is always going upstairs. Um, and he's always looking to develop his own career. Um, and it also happens in terms of your your position within the firm as well. So in your year at university or school, uh, like myself, I was uh, a prefect at school. I had um, I was rugby captain. I had all these kind of senior things put on me. And then when you leave, it's kind of like, oh, crikey, I'm not any of that anymore. And it could be quite a um, humbling experience. Um, but you have to understand that you need to be patient. You will absolutely have those opportunities. Again, it just takes time and trust to build up. Um, and also a really important point. Um, it's been mentioned about social media. Once you join a company, you are representing that company not only in a professional sense, but in a personal sense as well. Um, 
I don't want to see more doom and gloom, um, but there have been occasions I've known personally in the past with, with friends of mine who uh, may have posted something on social media, um, which has got back to their own company uh, and then has had repercussions there. I mean, we only need to look at the the Capitol building in, in the US where people were posting, I'm, I'm John Smith, I'm a lawyer at so-and-so firm, and then they lost their job. So it's really, really important that you you treat every action you do online as something that's not only going to affect you personally, but also could affect your firm. Um, so careers are there to be nurtured. I think, as I mentioned, that the plant in the hands. Um, to be honest with you, I'm still working on mine. Um, I'm challenging my own assumptions on a daily basis. At this moment in time, I'm looking to give myself options. So. Uh, if that's a change in career, if it's going back to education, it, it's always about constantly adjusting um, what your thought processes are based on the external environment. Um, but I think if, if I leave you with a thought, your career is, is yours alone. So treat it with respect and patience. Uh, don't rush to the destination because you might find out you're in the wrong place. Um, try and enjoy the journey uh, and all the sights along the way. Um, and I wish you the best of luck in the future. Um, it is tough. Be patient, be diligent, and you will get there. Um, thank you for that. I'll now pass back to Mark to carry on with the rest of the presentations. Well, thank you so much. That was really great and uh, really good advice throughout that. And um, yeah, no, very, very, very good, very inspiring as well. So thank you very much. You, you kind of some great advice on do's and don'ts. Um, I think a couple of things that I really picked up from that a reminder that lots of graduates don't know what support is available. And um, as Will has said, you know, make support, make use of the support that's available, whether that's through the National Career Service or your university career service um, and see what kind of support that is. Um, also, you know, another thing I picked up from that is getting a job if you can. It's easier to get a job from a job. Uh, we'll talk about the importance of having an income, uh, you know, moving back home and and but, but, but being able to start being, uh, you know, independent again. And um, really important. If I if I just think about my two daughters, one has got has managed to get a graduate role, but it was very much through the hidden job market that Dominic described. Um, she actually got her job as an interior designer by working in a health food shop part time, and an architect came in for some cough sweets. They got talking and he said, why don't you come in for some work experience? And that's how she got her job. My other daughter is uh, in a job that she doesn't really like and uh, it's not what she wants to do long term. But she's taken the approach of it's better to have a job and apply from a job than it is to not have a job. So she's learning what she can. I, I don't think she's sure what she wants to do. I think a lot of people are in that position, but um, but I think, you know, just reflecting on what you said there, Will, you know, thinking about what you're gaining from each job and, you know, and, and most people have many, many jobs in their in their career. It's much harder to get what, what you want straight away. So um, really good. Thanks to all of our speakers. But that, and that was really good. And now we've got a couple of our graduates talking about the support that they've had. So I'm joined today by uh, Jody. Jodie Woodhouse, who studied illustration and uh, with animation at Manchester Met, and I think used the career service to kind of get support in terms of career. And then, and then Jodie's going to introduce Jack Hills, who's a business management student from New graduate from Newcastle University, and is uh, running his own business. So it's really important to hear from graduates and their experiences. So Jodie, over to you. Thank you, Mark. Um, yeah, hello everyone. So. Um, I'll just be chatting today about my experience with using my university's career services. Um, so a bit about me, I studied illustration with animation at Manchester Met. And um, my first sort of interaction with the careers team was in first year, where I just sort of attended as many talks as I could all about different career paths. Um, and then in second year was the first time I booked a one to one with a careers advisor. And I also um, used our sort of career hub online website um, where I discovered a, like a local charity who were in need of a graphic designer, graphic design assistant. And um, so I, I phoned them up to let them know that I wasn't applying for the job, that I was really um, hoping to gain some experience. So if I, they could take me on board as a volunteer. 
So I stayed there for the next two years volunteering um, as an illustrator and worked with their design team and even attended an award ceremony um, on behalf of them and where we won best small, small comms team. Um, and then in third year was when I really utilised the careers team the most um, by sending them in my CV where they help with making appropriate alterations. Um, I also had regular meetings over Zoom as um, this was at like sort of March time of last year um, where we discussed things such as interview prep and the right kind of questions to ask in interviews. Um, I also had a lot of guidance with like preparing handouts for interviews, which really improved my confidence. Um, uh, so the, sort of the nature of what I do, graphic design roles um, require like a portfolio and application. So I seeked outside help for that um, through my like local design community. But the careers team really helped me articulate myself better in interviews and help me shine light on some of the experience I would gained from jobs um, and voluntary work and self-directed projects that I'd done outside of university. Um, in terms of my current career development, I just think my career team really helped me push myself into a role that I'm really enjoying and gave me the confidence and support that I really needed at that time. Um, but yeah, that kind of completes my presentation. And now I'll be passing on to fellow graduate Jack Hills. Hi there. Thank you, Judy. Um, so I am a graduate from Newcastle University um, and I studied business management. Um, so about two years ago, I thought of an idea with some of my housemates, um, which was as we cooked up different meats and things. So I started a company the a small game company um, which basically aims to make game meat more accessible and affordable um, even though I studied business management through a level and at that point done a year and a half at, at uni um, I still didn't have a massive um, knowledge base on how to actually go about starting a business so um, I got in touch with with a sort of pre startup advisor um at newcastle and it's, it's a brilliant service i'm sure at every university but um how it worked in newcastle was you had this pre-startup advisor who you would do your brainstorming with your sort of idea generation um and they would sort of start to formulate your idea um and from there i came up with a business plan um looked at doing an enterprise module in my third year, um, which meant that I progressed to a business advisor. Um, and that opportunity is there three years after you graduate. So I'm certainly making the most of that now. Um, I suppose really my sort of experience with the careers service is that um, you've really got to make the most of it and um, I think, as as Will said, no opportunity is going to really sort of just fall at your feet. But everyone's so willing to help if you're willing to get up and and go and see someone. Uh, so I've had a huge amount of support from the university. Um, I've managed to well, my business advisor put me forward to what's called an advisory panel, which is a team of external experts, um, and you get put forward for for a grant, which has allowed me to my idea and uh, yeah start trading so we've been trading now for for three months um in a very weird time but it's it's great fun um and yeah i couldn't have done that without the support of the newcastle career service um i suppose the opportunity that they provide yeah so lastly just the from going from the pre-startup to the business advisor to the external experts, you're, you're constantly networking, you're constantly working with all these different people. Um, and it opens huge amounts of, of new doors. So the external experts, um, I got introduced to a guy called John McRae, who is a marketing expert, and he's completely transformed my sort of social media outlook. Um, 
and we're now formulating different campaigns we're doing blogs all of that kind of thing which uh to be honest i was never particularly good at to begin with um i'm still definitely learning now um so yeah i suppose just to finish up i'd definitely just say go and talk to someone whether it's starting a business whether it's help with your cv or anything um it doesn't matter how big or small it is there is always someone there to to help you um and they have always they always seem to have that next stage for you to work on um which has really helped me to stay sort of progressing through i suppose what is the beginning of of my career um so i'm going to pass back to mark and i think we're going to go into q a thank you everyone for for listening and i hope it's useful Jack, thank you so much. That was great. And uh, I, it wasn't deliberate that we we got a Newcastle graduate to talk today. Um, it was just it was just by chance. But I really appreciate you, but about you, about, uh, I really appreciate you talking about your 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 business and the support that you've had, Jody as well. It's really useful to hear from both of you about your experiences. And one of the things that I've taken from this, and I'd always advise everybody, is to is to make use of the support that's available. Um, I always think that a career service is a bit like having a gym membership. If you want to hit your fitness target, you need to make use of the gym. It's not just enough. It's not enough just to have the membership. And I think that's true with with career support. Career services, National Career Service will help you as much as you need. Uh, and it's really, you know, it's, it's now making use of those those opportunities that are available to you. Um, so we're now going to go into Q&A. Um, so hopefully you've been posting questions and hopefully uh, you'll be forwarding those. If anything has come up today that you want um, that you want answering that you haven't had so far, please feel free to add them. Um, now I'm just looking for the questions that have appeared so far. Ah, now please please bear with me. Um, unless Stephen, is is there a question that's come up that you're about to answer? I was just looking at, at the list there, Mark, and uh, the first one uh, I can see is how can I make my CV stand out? OK, so Come if on. you're yeah, I'll, I'll take that one if you like. And um, there's a list of about nine different questions, but um, there's a few things that I would say with um, regard to that particular question, making your CV stand out. I think your profile is one of the key things because a lot of employers, you know, when I mentioned about the eight, nine seconds that they spend looking at CV, possibly even less like um, under six seconds, you want your profile to be short and sweet. So liken it to the blurb you get on the back of a book or a DVD, it's there to grab the employer's attention. To help you with that, I devise a little five point plan to kind of cover five key points that you want to get across to the employer and maybe put a line on each but um, those five points would be one what experience have you got so if for myself I'll just give it as a quick example I'm a careers advisor I've got 20 years of experience I've worked in schools um, worked in colleges I worked for National Career Service and with a wide variety of people as well so that could be my opening gambit roughly speaking <clears throat> Equally, you don't have to go with an exact job. So if you want to keep your options open and you're thinking about transferable skills, um, I could reuse that same information and put customer service professional instead with 20 years of experience in careers guidance and education. So you can use it one of two ways, zoning very much in on a particular career or zoning in on a transferable skill that you want to use. The second thing that I'd include is a core qualification that you know the employer is going to be interested in. So um, presumably for a lot of you, it's the fact that you're a graduate. So that would be the obvious one to put in there. For myself, it would be the diploma in careers guidance, for example. The third thing I would include would um, be a couple of core skills that you know the employer is looking for and that you feel a, a, a couple of your strengths. Highlight those. And then number four is think of an achievement or unique selling point. So the achievement, if it was sales orientated, for example, might be that you exceeded your, your sales target with X company or um, your unique selling point might be something along the lines that you can speak different languages. And that would be really useful, especially if you're applying to a company that's an international one. And then I think the fifth thing that you want to highlight is why you've applied or what you're looking to get. So some people might be looking for part time work, for an internship or um, a, um, a full full time role. 
and it's just highlighting what what it is you're looking for and maybe why so just have those five key points in mind and that will help with your profile and the second thing that I would say to make your cv stand out is think about achievements and sticking some achievements in your employment history because i see a lot of cvs and people have mixed in with their responsibilities what they've achieved and they can kind of get lost so if you were to separate them out and maybe have um what the job was where you worked and the dates and then underneath that a bullet point list of achievements and then under that a quick overview of your day-to-day -day responsibilities you're not losing that good information but if you're making notes again i would say things that could be achievements would be the fairly obvious promotion but then there's the additional responsibilities as well so um where you ask to mentor or train a new member of staff that that would be an achievement because the employer would be looking at that thinking why was he or she asked to mentor or train that new member of staff and straight away the the wheels will be um turning they'll be thinking well they're obviously a good example to other members of staff and um, they're able to communicate effectively they're a great team worker and it, uh, it basically is backing up the skills that you say you've got um, other things that I would probably include would be um, ideas that you've come up with and as graduates so I'd like to think that you've got lots of ideas that you've been throwing into the mix and the employer will be thinking yeah I like that idea let's implement it. A very quick example one young lady who was working at a warehouse realised that a lot of the staff were struggling to find car parts and um, she said to the boss can I colour coordinate the warehouse and the boss was a bit sceptical but let her do it and <laughs> basically all the staff start to find all this these car parts really quickly because for example say the exhausts were all down the red aisle and um, the, the wheels and the um, alloys and all the rest of it were down the blue aisle and so on and so forth so staff started to find this these these parts really quickly but that was a good idea that she thought of that improved productivity and obviously um, increase the sales so it's things like that that you really want to think about and also um, positive feedback a lot of people miss out on that and you kind of think you probably have positive feedback from customers colleagues managers in um, reviews etc so make sure you're sticking all of those sorts of things in your CV so that they stand out Great, Stephen. Thank you so much. That's great advice. And, um, and and obviously, don't forget as well, you need to try it. You need to get your CV on a maximum of two sides. So uh, when you're thinking about all the things that you want to include, think about the kind of high profile things. If you go to the uh, University Career Services, the National Career Service uh, sites such as Prospects um, or uh, GTI's website, you'll find loads of different examples of CV structures. And um, also, you know, Gareth highlighted tools such as Career360 where, you know, you can you can uh, make your CV online and it will give you advice about how to improve it. Lots of universities have that kind of software um, and lots of universities will actually just look at your CV as well. So great advice. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, we've got some questions. We've got a lot of questions, which is great. I've got a couple of questions for Maria. So I don't know if Maria can come on stage. I'm here. Hi. Hi, Maria. Got a couple of questions for you. First one, when it comes to career research, how can I get started? Well, one of my favourite tools for careers research is LinkedIn. It is fabulous. If you've not explored LinkedIn, please get on it. That's one of the first things you can do following this webinar. So every university will have their own profile on LinkedIn. And within that profile, you will notice a little tab that says alumni. And when you click into that, what that allows you to do is explore where graduates from your university, your specific course are now working. And that's hugely insightful because if you start with that basic career question, that research question, what do graduates from my course do? What do graduates from my university go on to do? Who do they work for? What are their job titles? LinkedIn will show you that. So you can explore it by a particular sector that you might want to work in, a particular location. So you might be interested in, in finding out where graduates from your university are now working in a particular city. Um, you know, what employers exist in that city? Who's likely to hire me as a, as a new graduate? And LinkedIn will unveil that. So that's a really useful resource for you to start your careers research. And, you know, don't forget, you know, ultimately one, one purpose of LinkedIn is 
to give people an online profile, an online CV as such. And therefore you can click into the profiles of individuals with interesting job titles or individuals who are working at companies that you are interested in working in and seeing where they started out. What was their journey? I think as we've we've heard today from other graduates is that everyone's career journey is unique, but actually hearing about the journeys of others can provide some much needed inspiration and a little bit more focus for you. Another tool that I really like using and a lot of I, I recommend it to a lot of the students graduates that I work with is prospects. I know you've already highlighted that mark, but there are hundreds of job profiles that exist on prospects and those job profiles highlight you know different jobs in a multitude of different industries and it will map out the roles and responsibilities for that particular occupation it will map out the sort of salary expectations routes saying you know any additional qualifications you might need um, so prospects is a fantastic resource and it's written by those profiles are written by career practitioners so they're impartial, they're up to date and they're well researched. Um, so they would be my top two tips in terms of getting started with your careers research. Great, thanks Maria. And do you find a lot of people really don't know what they want to do? Yeah, yeah, and that's absolutely fine. I think the key, the key thing is when you don't know what you want to do is the, your best friend is curiosity. Start asking questions. You know, like I said, you know, where do other graduates go on to work? And that might provide you some inspiration. You know, you might have studied, you know, graphic, you might have studied English literature. Where do other English literature graduates go on to work? And again, that might provide some inspiration. But I think it was highlighted um, in an earlier session that that, that self-awareness is a really important aspect of finding out what you want to do because you know sometimes we can look at lots and lots of jobs you can trawl through pages of jobs but you, you find you find yourself getting lost in them where do i fit in those so to find out where you fit in those it's a case of actually asking yourself having a conversation with yourself and saying what do i want what am i good at what are my preferences what type of environment do i want to work in what do i do well so asking these questions of yourself will be really helpful and provide you with a much clearer sense of direction and when you start to look at jobs then you will start to see a, a fit and a lot of universities will offer self-assessment tools um, I know the National Career Services offers them that's been highlighted but most universities will have those tools that can aid you in reflecting um, online that you can access 24 7. Great thank you it's uh I often find that students will say and graduates will say I don't know what I want to do so how can I ask a careers advisor and that is the bread and butter of what careers advisors do yeah. help help people to make decisions. Maria I've got another question for you uh -huh. which is, uh, where can I find the current jobs which are open for graduates? Okay so there's there's a wide range of places you can start I think there's been some you know there's very popular jobs boards like we said prospects, target jobs, total jobs, there's, a, there's the milk round, lots of well-known graduate recruitment websites that tend to advertise graduate schemes. However, don't let your search stop there. Think about if you're heading into a specific sector, you know, are there any sector specific jobs boards that you could be looking at? Perhaps the occupation you're interested in actually spans across a multitude of sectors. So I work with a lot of sports students and when the sports students just type in sports jobs in Google, they're actually missing out a load of jobs because sports students work in healthcare, they work in leisure, they work for local authorities, they work for a multitude of different sectors performing sports related roles, but don't just confine your search to one particular industry, don't just stay on the graduate jobs boards. Um, another piece of advice when it comes to exploring current opportunities is to look at your university careers websites because a lot of them will have a jobs board and those jobs board feature jobs that are typically jobs that employers have actively approached the university asking them to advertise. Um, another way is to stay connected to your university careers teams as we've seen from the presentations there's 
careers teams often will send job alerts out to you. They will send newsletters out to you and attend some of the events because most of the employers that come along to events that are organised by a university are actively recruiting and don't just leave it at attending the event. Follow up with that employer. Thank them for the time. Introduce yourself. You know, be proactive um, and remember the piece around the hidden jobs market. Don't wait for jobs just to be advertised. If there are companies that you've found through your careers research that interest you, get in touch with them. Great. Thank you so much. That's been brilliant. Well, lay off the hook and you've mentioned the hidden <laughs> market. So next up, I'm going to ask for Dominic, if, it, if that's OK, because uh, we've got a question for you. Hello. Hi, Dominic. And it's a question not about the hidden job market, but it's a question about have you got advice for how best to handle a job interview? Yes, I do. And I, you'll be unsurprised to know that I do a masterclass on that, Mark, as well. <laughs> ah, great. Um, so, yeah, I can sh I can share. I've got actually a document that I can sort of share uh, on that. But, but my background's in business psychology, so a lot of it is around behavioural approaching. So it's really understanding what your proposition is and how best to articulate that. But a lot of it is around competency based interviewing, particularly at grad level. It's actually to sort of show that you and demonstrate you have the right behaviours and evidencing that. Um, but again, I can I've got some collateral there that I can share. No problem at all. Great. So we'll put that in the can we we'll send that out afterwards. Is that OK? Yeah, of course. No problem at all. Yeah. Thank you so much. OK, well, in that case, I'm going to go to uh, Will, if that's OK. I've got a question for Will. Will, uh, nice to see you. Um, I've got a question about networking. Somebody's asked, how important is networking? And should I be networking? And if so, how? Um, the answer to the first two is yes. Um, it's, it, long and short, uh, it, it is important because I think as I touched on it, it opens up opportunities for yourself. Um, I think really understanding what's out there. I mean, just day to day for me, I'm learning about new types of jobs and, and actually what exists out there because there's so much. I mean, you go on LinkedIn, you you, you view a job and you, you may have no idea what it is, but actually you then start looking further down. And you think, well, actually, I could do this, I could do that. And networking allows you to build on the skeleton of a job description. So it gives you the muscle and the flesh and you actually understand what that entails. Um, and I think the question about how to network, um, I, I treat it a bit like LinkedIn. So you have your first connections, your second connections, your third connections on LinkedIn. Um, so first connections, your family and friends, absolutely speak to them, get their point of view. Uh, there may be your parents or your best mates, but they are actually the wise, believe it or not. And, and they have been around a lot longer than you have, especially in the case of your parents. So absolutely speak to them. Um, second connections um, are people that your parents put you in touch with or family friends put you in touch with. Go have a coffee, have a have a conversation with them um, on the phone or a socially distanced walk with the dog um, at the moment. I think that's always important. Um, and then the third connections are similar to what I did is understand a bit about where you want to go. Look who's done it before. Um, add them on LinkedIn, have an email exchange, have a virtual coffee. Um, but absolutely keep, keep inquiring, be curious, um, ask questions. And even if you're not the most confident of person, I've always found that um, as part of my role as chair of the uh, committee I was on uh, for the young professionals, we had a, quite a split between extroverts and introverts. Um, and even if you're very much an introvert um, and it may, and from, I'm an introvert, believe it or not, I've, I've done the Myers-Briggs test, I, I get energy from being on my own, um, but use that to your strength um, and actually have self-confidence enough to speak to people because they they are interested in what you have to say i mean if they said yes to coffee they want to hear you speak as much as you want them uh, you want to hear them speak so don't be afraid um, we are all in the same position as all the grads are today um we may seem i'll probably speak for everyone who's presented we seem like we have it sorted in inverted commas uh, but i can guarantee that probably most of us are still kind of eyes wide to, to opportunities um, and new experiences so um yeah I think that yeah, the short answer is yes, but that's a long answer. That's great. Thanks, Will. Thank you. I, as you're talking, you're, it's reminding me that uh, I quite often uh, a game I like to play. Who do who do you know who's famous? And if you say that to somebody, who do I know who's famous? People will often say, well, I don't know anybody who's famous. Mm -hmm. um, but if but if you think about your network, somebody in your network does know somebody who's famous and yep. they connect you to that person. There's a well-known fact, I think, that any person in the world is only three phone calls away. And that's because it's somebody knows somebody who knows somebody and uh, 
Yeah, I've, I've managed to get two signed football shirts from my favourite team in the last year, just because I've met a father of one of the players and also somebody that I play football with five aside works with the mum of another Bristol Rovers. Oh, sorry, I mentioned who it was now. Well, you can see how you can see how it works when I'm in the northeast and can get Bristol Rovers shirts. Anyway, thanks, Will. That is brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, we've got a question talking to Bristol for Gareth. Um, so I don't know if Gareth, if you can reappear. Gareth, hi, nice to see you. And you did a fantastic talk about uh, services that you provide at Bristol University. But I've had a question here about, you know, from somebody who says, well, I didn't go to Bristol. How can I utilise the, the opportunities or the kind of opportunities that you've described? Thanks, Mark. I'm glad to hear you're a proud Bristol Rovers fan as well. That's very important. Are you a, as a Bristol Rovers fan as well? No, I have seen them play. I, I moved here, but I'm glad to see that you're still throwing your support down towards the southwest. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I'm not sure which university this person attends, but uh, the support that I discussed is Bristol specific and it's open to Bristol graduates. Uh, but as you heard from the other speakers earlier, so Maria and Joe and also everyone else, every single university is offering graduate support. So there's so many resources, no matter which university you go to, that are available there to help you with your career planning. And I really strongly urge you to get back in touch with your university if you need to access any help at all. If you don't know what you want to do, if you need work experience, if you do know what you want to do and you want help applying, if you want to build your network, anything at all, they will have resources there to support you. And also not forgetting the National Career Service as well. Um, who are obviously at this event. Uh, Steve was talking about some absolutely fantastic CV writing tips. There's a, a mass of resources available on their website. They are there to help you. That's the sole reason this organisation exists. So do make use of all of those resources. There's an absolute army of careers advisors out there waiting to help you, I, I promise. One of the best things about my job is the fact that lockdown can be very isolating, but I get to spend most of my day having conversations with absolutely fantastic young people, talking to them about what they want to do, what their dreams are, what their hopes are, and, and helping them make some progress. And I promise there's people who want to do exactly that for you at your university. So just put the name of wherever you studied into Google, along with career service, you'll find their website in no time. You'll be able to access all of those resources. Great. Thanks, Gareth. Good, great advice. OK, um, so you talked a bit about the resources from the National Career Service. So my next question, if I can get Steve back, I've uh, got a question about resources. Uh, hopefully Steve will reappear. Yeah, there he back is. again, I think. So I've got, I've, a <laughs> I've got a question for you about what resources do you have that can help me identify my transferable skills? I think, um, as has just been mentioned, um, us careers advisors are, are a key resource because we've got the training and we've got a range of resources that we tap into. And I, I suppose we all have our little favourites, but I've, I've got to admit, for me, I quite liked um, some little um, worksheets that Carol Eichelberry produced in her Creative Careers book. Um, and she asked, I've made a note of one of the questions, what are you doing when you're so engrossed, absorbed, involved that you lose track of time? And I kind of think, yeah, it's it's what motivates you, what gets you going. And she gave the example of reading, baking, fishing. But um, I used this in a, in a redundancy workshop a few years back, but it was stuck in my head because one lady said, I love shopping, but what good's that for my future career? And a couple in the room said, oh, you could be a mystery shopper or um, in a personal shopper. And I said, well, that's the obvious link, but let's try and have a little uh, a bit of a dig. So I asked her, why do you like shopping? And she said, well, I love finding a bargain. So then I said to her, well, how do you go about finding this bargain? And then she was saying, well, I go on the internet, check things like eBay, I go into charity shops, go into the high street shops. And basically I just turned around and said, so research, research and a bit more research. And she sat there and was like, I absolutely love research. Uh, I don't know why I didn't think of it before, but you kind of think it goes back to what I was saying earlier. We can do something so naturally that we take it for granted. And sometimes you just need somebody to draw that out of you. And that's our job as a careers advisor, to help draw those things out of you so that you can identify what your skills are and what your qualities and strengths are. And I think once you've drawn that out, it's a case of actually then thinking about, well, how am I going to process that information? And that's the key thing, I think. And that's where the career matching programmes can be useful. But I think 
one of the things I'm always cautious of is that it is a computer and it's not fail safe. It's a, a starting point, basically. But I think one of the things I always encourage people to do is say they've got a list of, say, 20, 30 different things that they like is to then rank it. So which one's number 30 out of this lot, 29, 28, work your way up. As you get closer to that number one spot, you'll find it more difficult to decide between the say four, five or six. So those four, five or six would be your core. So when you're looking at different career options, instead of thinking which one best matches all these 30, which isn't going to happen, it's about which of the career options that are being suggested um, through, through say a career matching program, tick those the most boxes for, for the, those four or five core things and then you know you're on a potential winner so i think that's kind of important and like i said i, I quite like that um resource of carol eichel berries because it gets the, the the creative juices going i suppose you could say and gets you thinking about who am i what am i about and and then processing that information but like i said that's where we kind of um, come into play. But another thing that I often do with people, because you kind of think job satisfaction is one element of your career choice, but then there's other things as well. So you've got um, the wages and potential free time, because not necessarily for everyone, it's a full time nine to five job. They might want more freedom so they can go traveling and things like that. So I kind of encourage people to think of doing a triangle and in each corner put wages in one, free time in the other and job satisfaction in the other and then within that triangle plot themselves somewhere in there based on what is your core motivator so if your core motivator is job satisfaction then obviously that that list is going to be important and I don't think identifying that core is going to be vitally important but obviously there might be other things that are important to you as well so you need to factor other things into this whole process so it's not um, total um, blue sky thinking for one <laughs> or a better way of saying it um, and saying oh this is my dream job because at the end of the day there might be a job that you would really love but on the flip side it might not have the hours that you want so you might be thinking oh what do I do and like we were saying earlier you don't have to stick with a career for the rest of your 40 plus years of career history that are ahead of you you can chop and change from one to another so you might think right I like that career but at the moment travel's more important to me so I'll go down a different career path but I'll come back to this one later so it's being flexible Great, and that, and it's making personal decisions yeah. what suits you, and that's that's really good advice. Um, the, the resource you're talking about there, the book, is that something we could put into the Q and A or into the, or or send details of afterwards? Yes, that's something we can send afterwards. I mean, I've got um three different worksheets, and maybe we could include those. And it's got her website highlighted at the bottom, so that wouldn't be an issue. But yeah, they're really good resources. She's got another one on what motivates you as well. So it's taking in on boards the the side of things of what you want from the work but then there's the motivator so there's the um, the question of what constraints do you want to honour so there might be some constraints in your life at this moment in time you might be caring for a family member or something for the short term or looking after some younger siblings or something like that and that's a constraint that you have to honour for say maybe a year and then you can kick start your career from there but at least she's getting you to think about um, not just the career but the other stuff that goes around it. Great, thank you. That's really, really, really helpful. And um, and talking of things that people, um, Joe, I'm going to ask you to come up for a question if that's okay, because uh, Steve's just talked about you know people making choices, and a choice that a lot of people are thinking about at the moment is um, post grad study. And um, is this an area that's been affected? Well, is it an area that's been affected by the pandemic? What advice would you give to people thinking about post grad study at the moment? I think uh, postgrad study is obviously a really good option for many people. Um, I think one of the things I would say, though, is just make sure that you're doing a course that you've researched and you know that it's going to be leading towards a goal that you do want to do in the future. Um, universities are still offering postgraduate courses. Um, they're obviously going to be delivered online for the foreseeable. Um, there will be a return to um, some sort of blended learning, I would imagine, in the future. Uh, many, many universities actually are being quite flexible with start dates as well now. So I'm aware that many postgraduate courses are starting in January, as well as the usual September time. But 
I think my advice with postgraduate studies, it's always a good option if you know that it's going to lead towards a career or a goal that is really of interest to you. I wouldn't suggest just doing a postgraduate course just for the sake of it, because um, very honestly, you know, they're, they're quite expensive. It's a big, big investment and you've really got to be certain it's going to, to get you to where you want to be in the future. Great, thanks. Um, it's not always the answer the universities want to hear, is it? Because, you know, obviously we're laying on courses, but I think everybody here today, every careers advisor that you talk to or every career service you talk to is really interested in you as a person and giving you the best advice and um, not trying to push uh, opportunities your way. So it is a great opportunity sometimes, but it really depends on you, your course, lots of factors. Joe, thank you so much. Um, so and now, so I've got a question now for um, Will, actually, if that's all right. Will, can you come back? Yeah. This is virtual yeah. stage, it's virtual stage without the exercises. Brilliant. Uh, well, we've been asked what advice uh, we would give when asked in an interview what you bring to a job role when actually you're not sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I, I think my, my first bit of advice was don't find yourself in a situation where you're unsure. Um, I think as a lot of people have discussed today, treat your your job interviewing and career searching as, as very much a, a project. So you should absolutely have answers, understand who you are before that point. Um, I understand you can't prepare for everything, so you will get questions where you can't answer them. Um, so, I mean, my, my advice would be after having many interviews um, in, in my in my short career is, is first of all, just just take a pause, take a breath. Um, have if you've got a glass of water in front of you have a sip of a glass of water just buy yourself some time to, to really relax um, because if you go in panicking you're going to end up speaking at the interviewer uh, and probably say something that you you wish you hadn't um, so really take your time think about almost have a helicopter view of yourself think about the situation you're in what's the job you've researched the role up to this point what what are they going to look for so what if for example in, in insurance if I got asked asked that question, it would be, well, actually, I'm, I'm quite a, um, I'm very diligent. I'm, I focus on data analytics and, and just use things from your own experience you've had so far. So I would say I'm, I'm quite a sociable chap. I like going out there, I like negotiating with people. Um, I, I like, I'm a bit of a nerd. I like Excel, Excel spreadsheets and like try and try and create it in a personal, personal way, but also within the job spec that you've already researched. Keep it short, keep it snappy usually the rule of three is, is pretty good in that situation as well. So come up with one thing, come, don't think you have to get to three, um, but usually the rule of three is pretty good. So come up with three examples, short, snappy, intrigue the interviewer, um, uh, but prepare before that. Don't try not to find yourself in that situation in the first place. Okay, great. Well, while you're there, I've got this is, I'm going to ask Gareth the same question because it again relates to interviews, but I think you're this would be one that it'd be great to hear your perspective on as well. So Gareth, just to warn you that this is coming up. Are there any tips on how I can stand out from those who have got experience uh, if I've got less or, or no experience during an interview? What would you say to that one? Um, that's something I'm trying to do at the moment, actually. Um, it's, um, it, it's a really tough one. I think you have to come across as someone who's inquisitive, um, who understands the industry they want to go into, um, you will be challenged why you want the job. And sometimes that the understanding why you want the job is more important. So if, um, for example, if I wanted to move into digital transformation insurance, so the insure tech side, I would then go into how I believe that I want to help this industry be a better, more data driven industry. Um, I feel like my tools are in both the analytics and the, the selling side of that tool. Um, and it, sometimes it's about the intangibles because focus on yourself. Uh, again, it, it's what you bring to the table. So, um, yeah, it, it, it's quite a tough one because I'm going through that process at the moment. Um, but I think just be yourself. Be you've got to the interview stage. They want to see they want to know more about you. Don't stray from your CV too much and just add flesh to the bones. As I said before, add context to your answers. Um, I think it's probably the best way and be enthusiastic and uh, and willing again i'm using all the, the words i've used before but again they they, they across most so it's, it's good it's good advice it's kind of um 
yeah, it's it's in the preparation, thinking about what they what they're going to want from you, isn't it? Great, Gareth, you're here. Fantastic. So, same question for you, and just a reminder: Are there any tips on how I can stand out from those with experience during an interview if I've got less experience than them? Yeah, absolutely. So, I think Will hit on a number of the really important things there. Is that it can be quite challenging as challenging as a recent graduate going in thinking you're competing against people with loads of experience, but this is where you really need to have a very good understanding of yourself, your strengths, your unique selling points, because you're going to bring something completely different to that employer than everyone else. And you really need to know and be able to sell those individual strengths that you've got. But another way that you can stand out is something that will hit on again there, and it's really showing how motivated you are for that particular role. So carrying out your research, really knowing about the industry, knowing why you want to work in it, knowing about the employer, knowing what's interesting about them and why you've decided to apply for them as opposed to one of their competitors can really start to make you stand out. Because if you think about it from the employer's perspective, it costs them a fortune to advertise jobs and do interviews and recruit people and train them. And they want to find someone who wants to work there and is going to stick with them for a really good length of time. So they're looking for people with potential who are going to work there for, for a while. And if you can go in there and really show that you want to work for that employer, convince them of that potential, convince them of that motivation, they will think, I'd rather take a chance on this really enthusiastic young person. I think they're going to go places. And you can outdo people who might be coming with five years of experience if they are you know, slightly less passionate about taking that job than you are. So really make sure that you know your unique selling points, carry out that research and really, really show that you want that opportunity. Great. Thanks, Gareth. That's really good advice. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to finish with a couple more questions about interviews. So I'm going to ask um, Dominic to come back. And this is a really tough question that nobody likes being asked. But what, what, what advice would you give when salary is not disclosed in a job description? What, as in whether you're asked what salary you're looking for? What salary are you looking for from this job? And you, you know, how can you prepare for that kind of question? Right. What a question to, to answer. So so there, there's a couple of things here in terms of rule of thumb. Um, so there's a the first thing, I guess, is is to never give a range. So if you're sort of going to give a range that say between sort of 20 or 25 K, then then that, it's like a purchasing option. So what would happen is you probably want the higher range. Uh, but if you were offered, then you'd, kind of, you'd be offered at the lower range. So so it's very important not to give a range. Um, the other thing that I think is really, really important with salary when discussing at interview is never, ever, ever to quote a number. Um, and the reason for that is that it's probably one of the most non-negotiable points in an interview. So it's not, say, for example, if you was quoted a number, an organisation will never offer you more than what you've asked. Um, they may offer you more if you, so it's really, really important to sort of not quote, quote, quote a salary. I think the real answer to that is to sort of try and be non-specific and sort of say, look, you know, you know, you're open to sort of offers, but really it's the the opportunity that you're really interested in. So the the real way to answer that is actually a motivational answer. Um, and then sort of the next question will be how you, you you can negotiate that later on. But at first interview, it's probably the key not to, to sort of try and steer away from any financials, Mark, is what I would say. Yeah, that's good. That's, that's very helpful. I suppose the other thing that would be helpful is to take your agent with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm available to, to help with any negotiation, Mark, of course. I'm happy to help. <laughs> Thank you. OK, um, I'm just going to actually, Dominic, you stay here, please, because um, I've got sure. another question. which I'm also going to ask to Maria, but this is another tricky question. Um, how do you handle questions which ask about your greatest weaknesses? And then we'll ask Maria the same question because this is such a horrible one. Yeah, I can. I, do you want me to go first on that one, Maria? <laughs> That'd be great. Go for it. Okay. Yeah. So, so the, there is a rule of thumb with regards to to this. Um, so the first thing is to to be honest. So to be honest about what you what your weakness is. Um, the second thing is is to to sort of try not to use emotive language. So you know if you sort of get demotivated by this or you hate doing X or Y or Z, just try and remove any sort of emotive language. Um, and then I guess the the third thing is really to whatever your weakness is, 
uh, be very open and honest about what that is, but also talk about what you're doing to um, to try and address that. So if you fully addressed it, then it's not a weakness. But if it's something that you're working on, then I think that's quite an endearing sort of quality. Where years ago, when I used to sort of recruit at project management level, I had uh, and program management level, uh, I had one per I had met hundreds of people, and I had one person say that they were really. Uh, they found it really difficult to do stakeholder engagement um, and deal with the sort of uh, the business. Uh, and I literally almost fell off my chair because most project managers tell tell everyone how good they are. Um, uh, but it was a very honest thing. And it was that that part was a key part to that role. And that person got hired because the organisation had exactly the same challenges and it was something they wanted to work on together. So it's a real strength to answer that question really well, I think. That's great. Thank you. Maria, same question. How do you yeah. do it? I mean, that, yeah, just to, you know, reiterate what Dominic said there, you know, it's employers aren't looking for you to be superhuman. You know, nobody is good at everything. You know, what employers are really looking for through using that question, they're not make the they don't want to make you feel bad because it can often come across that way. Oh gosh, why are they making me talk about something I'm not good at? And it feels awful. But ultimately what they're asking you to demonstrate is you are self-aware, you are taking steps to improve, as as Dominic said, um, and that you're able to demonstrate an area that you've progressed in. So rather than seeing it as a question where you're discussing your weaknesses, you could reframe it as a question where you're discussing your development, where you are developing right now. Um, so if you reframe it that way, it can sometimes feel a little bit more comfortable. Great, thank you so much. Very tricky question and um, but great advice from both of you. And um, and I think you could probably see now the final slide. So I think this is my prompt that we're going to need to wrap up. So on behalf of everyone who's spoken today, can I just say thank you? You've all been very, very helpful. Great advice. Um, hopefully for those of you who've been uh, tuning into this uh, event today, it will have given you lots of food for thought, lots of resources that you can look at and we'll be sending these after the event. Also people who can help you and uh, you'll see a couple of, uh, of things on here. One is uh, University Career Services. If you're not sure, I mean the simplest thing is to is to look at your university and you know put in a search, Google search if you're not sure York University Career Service and it will come up and um, but if you're not sure there's also a link on there which we'll share afterwards which will also give you the connection to the different universities around around the country I think the other thing that I would just say is it, I would go back to your own university in the first instance, but you might find that in the region that you're living that they have initiatives where which actually do reach out to you. So we heard from Joe, for example, in the Midlands, who said that their career services are able to see people who aren't their own graduates because of funding that they've been able to get. So I would start with your own career service, but they might put you in touch with a more regional one or even just look and I and following on social media and stuff like that really really important and then the other link on here is to the National Career Service of course careers advice uh, a very good web very good and extensive website and telephone number if you're looking for help and support and you know with something like careers careers advice never feel that it's a one-off because you know it's very rare that somebody goes into an interview and says I really don't know what I want to do and 45 minutes later they come out with a great idea so you know do make use of the resources available to you so these are on here and we'll circulate them after the event if we can just move to the last slide I've got a I've got a request for you and this is uh, some research that we're involved with at the moment and it's to find out about the opportunities of our graduates who are leaving university and how this has impacted your career um, if, if I could ask you, I mean, if you can get a, um, a, a phone and take the QR code there, or we will send it out after the event as well. If you wouldn't mind sharing your experience, that will help us to provide support for all of our graduates. Um, and um, I think there's an incentive to, you will help. Oh, I think there was, Anyway, if I could ask you to do that, it'd be massively helpful. Tell us the effect on your career. Just even doing that, I think will help to will help you to think about what it is that you are looking for. So um, please contribute to that survey. Please follow up the addresses that we provided. We will be in touch with the information, the resources that you've asked for during the session. And so just, you know, finally, thanks to you for participating today. Um, I know everyone's really busy. 
Um, but it's really good that everybody's been involved, whether you've been a speaker or more importantly, somebody who's joined us looking for advice. So thanks very much. I think that's it for the event and um, good luck with your, you know, with whatever it is you're going to do next and in the future. Really hope it works out.